Yes, you. Are you a nurse or becoming a nurse or even just have an interest in the nursing field? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then this message is for you. On August 27 and 28th, from 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time and 1700 Tanzanian time, you are invited to the Inspirational Pathway of Nursing Conference. Dr. Kaboni in the Quality Healthcare Solution and Consulting Incorporation is inviting a number of amazing panelists in the nursing field. They hold a vast number of experiences that will be shared and the goal is to inspire the young nurses to engage in further studies, clinical research, and to have a more holistic approach to enrich the nursing profession. Elise Peterson. Elise holds an honors of bachelor's in social science degree in nursing and also in psychology, a post diploma in nursing education and administration, and a master's degree in psychiatric nursing. Her career started as a lecturer for psychiatric nursing and she proceeded to deliver clinical nursing services in tertiary and rural hospitals. Her clinical nursing career spans across psychiatric nursing, general nursing, midwifery, and oncology. During her time working in cardiothoracic intensive care units, she had the privilege of delivering person-centered care where her psychiatric nursing background was also fulfilled. Elise has been involved in clinical research for the past 26 years and she continues her clinical research career as an independent nurse researcher. She has a passion for capacity building with a specific emphasis on clinical research. Elise has research study involvement in psychiatric genetics, colorectal cancer genetic, colorectal adenoma polyp prevention, latent tuberculosis infection amongst healthcare workers, and extensive drug resistance tuberculosis. She has publications in 19 journals, including three first author publications in The Lancet, plus one in Tropical Medicine and International Health. She is published in two book chapters and has done 15 conference workshop and poster presentations. The awards you received include the Bongani Mayosi National Health Scholarship Program in 2013. Ms. Elise holds memberships in a multitude of organizations, including being an editorial board for the primary healthcare research and development for Cambridge Press, board of directors in the International Institute of Clinical Research Nurse, President and Founder, Board Member of the International Association of Clinical Research Nurse, and Board of Directors for Africa Interprofessional Education Network. Let's take a moment to acknowledge and welcome Madam Elise Peterson. Dr. Gwendolyn D. Randall. Dr. Gwendolyn D. Randall is a seasoned, certified registered nurse anesthetist with a broad background in healthcare management and academia. She received a bachelor's in science degree from Howard University and Norfolk State University. She also received a master's of science in nurse anesthesia from St. Joseph's University, Pennsylvania Hospital School of Nurse Anesthesia a Master of Science in Nursing from Temple University, and a PhD in Nursing from Barry University. She also completed a postdoctoral fellowship in simulation at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. She has lectured nationally and internationally on a broad array of topics. Her passion is global health, and health disparities. 
Dr. Randall takes great pride in her role in providing clinical and didactic instruction to the students in the inaugural class of the Masters in Anesthesia program at Addis Ababa University in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Dr. Randall is a current member of the QHSC. Let's take a moment to acknowledge Dr. Gwendolyn D. Randall and give her a warm welcome. Katunzi and Pilius Mutalemois. Katunzi Mutalemois is an evolving young Tanzanian nurse leader who obtained his baccalaureate nursing education from the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical University College in Tanzania. He is currently in the process of completing his one year internship at the Benjamin Mukapa Hospital in Tanzania. Mr. Kantunzi was honored to write his Bachelor's of Science in Nursing thesis on nurses' experience of caring for LGBTQ patients with HIV infections, guided by Travel B's Human to Human Relationship Model at Swedish Red Cross University in Sweden. He is the author of multiple professional articles and books, including the book title, Nursing, the Cornerstone of Healthcare System. This book is to inspire his fellow nurses in Tanzania. He is a former chairperson of the University Nursing Students Association of Tanzania and a founder of Tanzania Youth Nurses Forum. He previously worked as NCD's nursing officer and assistant project manager in NCD's project with organizations of Doctors with Africa in rural areas of Tanzania. Furthermore, he is the managing director of the recently registered NGO's Better Community Health Organization in Tanzania. For years now, he has been organizing various community activities such as blood donation events, massive screening on NCDs, charity giving works, and radio programs on topics regarding health, specifically reproductive health and children's health. Let's take a moment to recognize Mr. Katunzi Mutalemwa and give him a warm welcome. Wilson Fungamesa. Wilson is a Tanzania nurse working at the Muhimbili National Hospital Longozila campus since 2017. He's currently working at the Department of Training, Research and Consultancy. He earned a degree of Bachelor of Science in Nursing from St. John's University of Tanzania. He is also a clinical instructor at Muhimbili National Hospital, Loganzila Campus. Wilson has succeeded to innovate the so-called improved bubble CPAP device that is used to manage, treat newborn babies with respiratory distress syndrome. He has also managed to write and publish a book for all nurses known as Nursing Diagnosis for Academic and Clinical Practice, first edition, first edition in 2021. Wilson received a number of awards from different aspects due to his contribution and achievement in the nursing profession in 2021. Today, Wilson encourages young people especially young nurses, to be innovators or researchers in the nursing profession. His life example teaches us to follow our dreams no matter how great. Let's take a moment to welcome and recognize Mr. Wilson Fungamiza. I know people are still coming in, but we're gonna, uh, in the essence of time, we're just gonna start right now. So thank you for everybody who has been here before and at the time of um, the conference starts. And um, I welcome you all. And we're going to give a chance to people to ask questions towards the end. Um, so the process will be, um, we have our moderators, and they'll be asking questions to the panelists. And the panelists will try to do um, 
as quick as we can, as short as we can, so we can share more information with everybody else. And if we have follow-up questions, then we ask the questions. For the audience, if you have any questions regarding to specific panelists, please use the chat room um, underneath on bottom right. Just type your question in there, and then I will read the question to the um, to the panelists. And then if the time allows, then towards the end, people will be able to um, ask their actual question um, on um, live. Uh, because we have six of them, and um, if you have seen the video when you're registering, you can see um, they have done so much. And this is just on the ice in the cake. So there's more of um, experience and um, dedicatedness is everywhere else. So if you fit on that criteria, and you feel like you are you have contributed the, um, in the nursing profession, and you want us to know and learn about you, just please uh, contact us through the email, drgabonequhsc at gmail.com. And then so we can feature you for other um, conferences when we have. As I said, we want to share our experiences so we can ins inspire people and encourage more people to come to our profession. Hence, we're going to help so we don't have to overwork ourselves. So we want other people to appreciate our um, dedication and passion of taking care of the patients and also give us an opportunity to be able to affect everybody else um, in the world. And we know without nurses, healthcare is not going to survive. So, and if you have nurses who are in, um, inspired, nurses who are competent, nurses who know what they're doing, then you will be able to save lives and also save the whole community. So uh, without uh, wasting more time, um, I am gonna ask uh, one of the moderators is already here, Ms. Kathleen Kitige, if you can um, say hello so they know who you are. Yes. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for yeah. coming. Thank you too. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. I'm Catherine Gitige. I'm working at this hospital. I'm a nurse, but also I'm a, an epidemiologist. It is a great opportunity to meet you guys today. Welcome all. Thank you very much. And, um, we're going to continue hearing more of you while I was you ask the panelists here. And I believe we have um, Dr. Ashley Peterson here, and I see Mr. Wilson Fungameza. And we're all going to give you chances to um, give you a little brief um, introduction, and then uh, we um, allow other panelists as uh, they come in. Because some of them are working, so you know, nurses. <laughs> Yes, we do want to do our work also, save lives and still come to our conferences because we have to share our experiences in order to inspire other people. But also we yeah. always know patients come first. So I do appreciate um, and we welcome for the panelists when they get a minute to come and say hi and then they can join us. Um, so for right now, I'm going to give Mr. Wilson just to say hi before we start asking you more questions. Karibu. Asante, hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, uh, my name is Wilson Fungameza. Uh, I'm a nurse working at Mwimbili National Hospital Mloganzila at the Department of Research, Training and the Consultant. Okay, you are warmly welcome. Thank you very much. And I cannot wait because um, Mr. Wilson <laughs> did an excellent thing, which I'm um, even a new nurse. To nurse so. When I saw your resume, things that you have done for the our tiniest human being, newborn. So I was so excited. So I cannot wait to hear what you have done and how much that contributing to reducing neonatal mortality. So thank you for coming in. Um, thank you for all you do for nurses. Thank you too. Yes, um, I'm gonna welcome Dr. Elise Peterson. If you can come and say hi, please. Hi, I'm Elise, and you saw a bit of me in the video clip. I'm from South Africa, and I'm delighted. I'm really honored that you asked me to come and share and inspire, hopefully inspire more people to get involved in clinical research. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And um, Dr. Elise is going to share with us um, her bio, if you've you watched this video a few, few seconds ago, and also if you watch when we're registering, she has a vast experience in re clinical research and she has done so much to contribute in nursing. And that's how you're gonna learn. As a nurse, you can do so much um, 
finding um, ways to improve patient care by in increasing more knowledge to yourself and then empower other people so we can save lives. Because remember, our nurse is always, it's the healing hands, holding the life of the individuals, ourselves and our family members and our neighbors. So learning more and empower yourself more to be creative and um, help other human being, it's our goal. So um, I'm just so excited today. Um, okay, and I know there's some, um, and they said the panelists are still um, working, but they will join us as uh, momentarily. And um, so I'm gonna let uh, Miss Kathleen, if you can um, start um, another question to the panelists who are here. So Mr. Wilson and uh, Dr. Elisa are here. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. My questions go to Wilson Fungameva. Uh, from you, Wilson, I heard you were working with the research institution at Mrunganzira. I wanted you to inspire the team here and the others. Why our nurses have very low publication and how are we going to change this situation? Okay, thank you for good questions. As you have said, it is true that most of nurses are not publishing and there are some number of reasons and these have been caused by different reasons, including uh, patient to nurse ratio. This happens when a nurse is overwhelmed during ward activities. It means that she or he lacks the time for making something, for example, to pass it through literatures and try to read and write something so that uh, that nurse, she or he can be a researcher. So if you find the ratio of patient and the nurse who is working in the ward is not fair, so this becomes a difficult situation for that nurse to conduct a, a, a research. But also, there are some factors such as most nurses who are studying, for example, who are studying BSN nursing or masters, after completing their uh, studies, they don't engage in research. So this makes them not to publish a lot of, and you find some cadres like uh, doctors are publishing daily and daily. For example, here at Moimbili National Hospital, Mloganzila, up to now, when I'm talking, there are three researches who have been conducted. And you find among of these three are conducted by doctors, while our nurses are not engaging, as due to a number of reasons, as I have said, one of patient to, to nurse is huge, they lack that time. But also, there is, uh, we so-called, most nurses wiry, uh, they are at the area, for example, who are working in the clinical areas. After completing their, their study, instead of doing, for example, patient care, uh, you find they are doing their works which are not relevant. It means that if you are doing the works that are not relevant to patient care, it becomes difficult to start to do our search. So the way in order to overcome this problem, uh, the first thing, nurses should be involved in research process. For example, if there is a certain research is conducted, a nurse should be involved from the beginning up to the end and not just correcting the data. Uh, another thing which will help will help uh, this nurse is to be uh, just, they should participate in scientific conferences. For example, there is the, we call annual general meetings in Tanzania, which conducted every year. This will help 
uh, nurses to gain appetite, that you call appetite, to conduct a research once they see other people are presenting their scientific conferences. And also improving documentations. Most nurses who are working in clinical areas, sometimes they do not document or the, the things that they are documenting cannot reach them to scientific proof. For example, you will find the nurses just are documenting like reporting that I have, I, I, I have cared for the patient, I fed, then the nurse ended, the, instead of giving us the solution, for example, if you are caring a patient with pain, uh, you prepare a documentation, let's, let, let's say nursing care plan. Nursing care plan directs a nurse what to do and you also what to evaluate with a specific time. It means that if a nurse document properly about a nursing care plan and they evaluate, for example, if she or he finds that the pain is not reduced, that nurse will try to think and search more materials, what are some other pain reduction for that patient. So through that, you find that the, uh, the nurse is improving. Uh, oh, that, was to... very, sorry, that was very good. I mean, you hit <laughs> you yes. hit a couple of points which you was like, oh my God. Um, yes, one of the, for example, Puento said about the research part, um, Yes, I mean, I work in academic um, center before, so the doctors are publishing quite a bit, which is part of their requirements and part of the work. I agree. And they will use nurses to collect the data, but then their names don't appear anywhere on the research. So that is the part that we do need to um, advocate for nurses. If they're involved to collect the data, then they should be good enough to appear on those research so they can get the credit that the nurses are the one who collected. And then, of course, the nurses have to be trained for it. So, I mean, I, I do agree 110% for that point. Exactly. So that was very good, um, Mr. Wilson. Yeah. Thank you, Fungameza, okay. for you the much. nice response. Um, Dr. Gaboni, I see the people in the waiting room. Yeah, there's only one person I already click for them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Wilson. And uh, do you think the reason you mentioned is enough to exempt that nurses, they don't have to publish because of the reason you said it? Do we exempt them because of that reason? Yes, that is why they don't publish. It means that as I have explained that, for example, patient, patient to say next to patient rate, it seemed to be a heavy. It means that if a nurse enters into the shift, you find all the time is working or overloaded. So to get the chance of publishing becomes different. But for in case of nurses who are working in schools, it's possible. But uh, for Tanzanians, most you find those who are publishing, maybe who are at the school teaching like tutors or lecturers. And this, I can say, because always they are studying, first, always they are studying, but at the same time, somehow they have the time, the time to search for materials. But for a nurse who is overwhelmed, always become difficult. Okay, thank you. I uh, would like to ask the same question to another panelist. I saw uh, Miss Elise. Yeah, Dr. Elise. Yeah, Dr. Elise, yeah. can you respond to the same question? Thank you, yes. Um, I'm going to take it from a different angle, um, and that is from the research design angle or the research process. I have had editors of journals saying to me, they wish they, they get publications, they get submitted articles to be reviewed for publications. But because of the fact that upstream, when, when the research started, the research design was 
questionable. And, and that impacts the whole research process. So they wish they could publish the article, but they cannot because the, 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 this, the methodology, sometimes how the, the, the study was aimed, um, there's just a disconnect. So what I'm saying is, as, as um, nurses are not publishing because of the fact that they there's a capacity building that's needed for nurses to be able to to conduct the whole process and that's where I think I did, uh, definitely I agree with Wilson because because the PI is the principal investigator is usually the medical doctor is usually, if it's a, a laboratory based um, study, it's usually the scientists. So we as nurses in Africa, because I know in America it's different, you know, there's definitely nurse scientists like they are the PIs, they are the principal investigators. I'm sure you've been a principal investigator, Dr. Harriet, many times. But in, so I'm talking about Africa. We, for some reason, uh, and, and, and I think there's many reasons, we do not have the experience to start from the beginning, identify the research question, write the proposal, go through all the steps of that, think about the design, the data collection, et cetera, et cetera. But we write the article and then it's not publishable. And, and I can just repeat, uh, more than one editor, and in fact, a professor here that's at, that's the vice chancellor at the um, University of Stellenbosch. She's the editor of an Africa-related journal. And she told me that as well as, as somebody in the UK. So that's one huge reason where we need to start to build capacity. Um, the other reason is because there's a paywall. You know, <laughs> once we wrote the article and then you go, where am I going to publish? And then you see, but to have it published, you need to pay $5,000. So the stop is with the paywall, which is unfortunate. And the, the another reason is, I do think that as nurses, the value that we have, that we put on publications is not valued. We don't think that, you know, I, I was the same. That, that article of mine that was published as the first author in The Lancet. I thought, okay, you know, this, I've got a publication. Until the, the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences came to me and he said, congratulations, you are a first author in The Lancet. I thought, okay, you know, whatever. That's, that was really my, <laughs> that was really how I thought it. And then I realized, but this was an accomplishment in the PI world. That's not my world. I was a, I was the, the, the student. I was a PhD student. As a nurse, my world is def was up to that point. Not to value. I know I had to, you know, it's, 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 it's nice to have a publication. So, the value that we as nurses put on publications are, we need to rethink the value, and to rethink that value is to, to um, tell our fellow nurses what a publication is about, and what it can produce for you in your career, and the value that it has in, 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 in sharing the evidence that you created. And ultimately, nurse, uh, 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 the research is not a one-man show. 
it's a team. So least um, study designs are for one author. So we also need to learn to, to be co-authors with others and to be co-authors with other professions. And I'll stop there because, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for a very nice response. What was the second question? Um, I'm coming to the second question. Can I ask? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Now I, I, I'm asking to Elise to continue to, to answer the question I'm going to ask. Uh, how are we going to get mentors to influence a nurses to conduct a research and not just to be a research assistant, the data collectors? How are we going to get mentors? Maybe it will help. Well, the only way, the first way to get a mentor is to ask for a mentor. But the, 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 the for me, the question is first, what is a mentor? What, what are you looking for? You know, because can I be a mentor? I've actually been a mentor for, for, a, for a student that's a political science student. And she, somebody knew I was busy with studies and my friend said to me, but you know about research. I said, but I don't know anything about political. She said, just talk to my friend. She's a bit, you know, she, she, she needs somebody to talk to. And in that process, I realized that it doesn't matter the study field. It matters the, the science of, the, of research. So to get mentors is to ask for a mentor. Uh, if you do not know, I suppose, you know, maybe with your organization, Dr. You can, you can have a, a bank. You can have a, a, a list of names of mentors like who are prepared to be mentors. And, but then it's, the question is, what is the criteria and the quality? Criteria is one thing and quality is another thing. What criteria you, can you be a mentor for a PhD student if you are not a, if you haven't got a PhD? Can you be a mentor for a master student if you so so that's the criteria you need to I don't think ultimately the criteria needs to be that you're in the same study field mm -hmm. and then there's the what's the quality? Is it somebody that wants you to do what I tell you to do? Or is it somebody that can engage with you on your process of what you need to be mentored on? So there's three things. Ask, uh, qualify who you want and know what you want. Do you want a mentor to spoon feed you? then don't call that person a mentor, <laughs> please. <laughs> or do you want, you know, recently somebody said to me, oh, a friend of hers is battling with her bio stats. She's busy with the public health, the masters in public health, and she she's battling with the, the formulas. Can I? I said, of course. But when I said to her, so let that person tell me what she's battling with, I've, I've never had a response back because that person wanted me to do the, this, the, the, the form, you know. So, so it's three things. Ask, know what's the criteria and also know what you want to be mentored on. Very good. Okay. That was very good, Dr. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do, concur. I do concur with Elise. Um, among of the expected PhD candidates, I was thinking, who, who will mentor me? 
So the criteria I think is very good point. I, I picked it from the response. Now, uh, Wilson, I saw you have developed some devices for improving neonatal health. Uh, can you respond to the same question? Maybe you have been mentored to reach there. So now, uh, on the part of publication and the nurses doing research, do you think, how are we going to get these mentors? What mechanism we will use to get the mentors? Maybe the people have an intention, but they don't have somebody to guide them. Okay, thank you. Exactly, is what I've been said that uh, without mentorship, you, ca you cannot reach at a certain extent. Actually, uh, in order to get uh, good mentors, uh, nurses should start, or it means that should improve their level of education. For instance, uh, if we have a Bachelor of Science in nursing, you are supposed to increase your level for masters or PhD so that you will be able even to mentor who are below your level, for example, who are, who are uh, at degree level. Uh, I say, for example, when I was doing my innovation, uh, I used my mentor, who is now a dean of School of Nursing at Muhimbili University, Muhas, called Dr. Dixon. It means that always he was mentored in me, or oh, showing me the way, okay, you have right this way, but you are supposed to do this way. Because I believe difference in your education is very important, including experience. Uh, you can be experienced, but it comes on how now you can analyze the things and come with the solution, it depends on level of education. Therefore, the good way to get mentors, just people should study hard so as to increase the level of education. But also, on my side, what I think for those who are very interested uh, in research, for example, in research, should be supported and if possible, should go and be trained instead of only nurses be placed in one side. So that can be one of the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do agree with Mr. Wilson. Um, yes, so I think it, as a bedside nurse, when they think of research, it's a monumental task. So they're thinking this is gonna be the end of the world. I have to have money for this money for that. So it, it sounds so big to a point that they don't wanna do it anymore. Uh, revisiting the point that Mr. Wilson raised before that they, because of the nurse shortage, burnout, excessive long hours, whatever. So nurses just comes and work and run and go home. So when you tell them to do anything beyond, it's gonna be hard for them to be motivated to do those things. However, we still have to think if we were working on those environments that they're so hard and you can't, um, you can't find any solution for that, how are you gonna be able to improve or get out of it? Otherwise it's gonna be day in, day out. Doing research might be providing information about, okay, maybe we should do this way at work so then we can get better. But I agree with the need for education. So if somebody has not um, done either master's or a PhD, you may not have that level of uh, inquiry to try and find something that you can go beyond of just everyday practice. So you do have some education there. So you cannot ask somebody to, uh, to engage in research, but they don't even know what is research because there's so many terminology that we throw around for somebody who does not know, they think it's, it's overwhelming. So, and sometimes, I mean, like I said, Mr. Wilson have um, an innovation, which is an excellent one. So in bedside nurse may think, okay, research, I have to have this much stuff to do, but see, you can still do research with collaboration with somebody else, starting with what you do every single day at the taking care of the patient. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of things to learn and having an exposure or more education will mm -hmm. help 
um, the nurses to see where they can do, where they can engage, and how can they participate with the level of um, education they have right now, and then aspire to get more education and get more um, exposure. So, I mean, that was a great um, response, uh, Wilson. Ms. Catherine? Yeah, yeah, I think I'm done with two questions. Another moderator may take them. Or oh, the panelists are in all. No, you are it. <laughs> so continue with other questions. <laughs> okay. I saw Elise like you want to say something. Can, can I just also say the start of the research is not when the nurse are, um, nurses are qualified. The start of the research and, and the cultivating the research culture amongst nurses starts with the first year. I, I strongly believe that. And, and my, my, my colleagues in, that's involved with education, they tell me, but the, the curriculum is too full. I tell them, but you can't afford not to have research as part of your curriculum and not just as a module, because it's it's a it's a to demystify this. Oh, it's 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 high for, it, it costs money. I can't do it, and yeah, you've got to be clever to do it. And all is to to start even just with case studies as as a research design, as a research method, but as a as a student. I strongly believe that that's where it's got to start. Just wanted to put that. No, I do agree with um, Dr. Elise with that. You just start from the beginning. Um, and I said, I think more knowledge or more education will help um, nurses to make those decisions. So that's, um, go back to Mr. Wilson. My question is, but I said, when the nurses think of the research, it may be out of um, thought because it's too big. So since you are working at the bedside, how did you come up with fingering out, okay, I'm gonna innovate something to help me taking care of this newborn who are dying in front of me without any help. So how did you get to there? Because I mean, as I said, you don't need to have a PhD or master's or bachelor to be able to start engaging in this research or case study or performance improvement. You don't need all those education. You need those education in order to be able to plan and um, execute what you're planning to do. That's how it comes to working with people who are qualified to do that. However, so for your case, how did you start and what trigger you, what inspire you to do that, to be able to um, provide that solution for the need of these babies? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as I have said, there are two things which are parallel, uh, innovation and research. And uh, most you find that innovation comes first and uh, analysis can came later. For example, myself, uh, when I was employed at Mimbili National Hospital in 2017, uh, we started to establish neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, during that time, there are some equipment uh, we are not available. For example, we call CPAP machine, continuous positive airway machine, was not uh, available. And during that time, uh, I was not competent like that caring newborns. Uh, we, were, we were shifted uh, at Mwimbiri National Hospital for rotation so that we can become competent and we come later to care to our unit. Uh, during rotations, I was observing what is going on at Mwimbiri National Hospital Upanka uh, because there were bubble CPAP machines and I was observing how premature babies were put on a CPAP machine and the how we are surveyed. With that situation, uh, of course, it comes to my heart. How are we going to solve this problem into our unit? Because especially these premature babies who are dying. Because during that time, 
just we were given uh, oxygen therapy uh, like treatment uh, only for those who are developing respiratory distress syndrome. And, and the studies show that more than 80% for premature babies who are born always develop respiratory distress syndrome. So to look that, I was very thinking, how are we going to solve this problem? Because it seemed to be uh, a situation. Uh, uh, I started to study, of course, myself, and passing from different li literatures, how you can come up with a solution, especially how to control respiratory disease syndrome. Uh, and finally, uh, I developed the, the so-called improvised bubble CPAP machine device. And that device does not depend on electricity. And, and the most just use cost available materials to construct it. Uh, good enough, this improvised bubble CPAP device can be used even in remote area due to its cost almost uh, about uh, about uh, $400 dollars you can use because you use nasopron chops uh, of course it's not easy <coughs> so we started to conduct uh, using that device almost after six months is uh, we try a retrospective start to, to look out how efficient of this machine is before using improvised bubble CPAP. It means the time when we were using without CPAP machine. It means newborns, especially prematures, were put on the oxygen therapy only. So through that, after six months later, we conduct a retrospective start and the results revealed that uh, uh, death rate were reduced from 15% to 9%. So thereafter, uh, uh, I will, I presented to the management and the management appreciated this. And there was a, there were a certain meeting which was encompassed between different uh, professionals, including pediatric doctors, nurse specialists, and the management. So uh, I, uh, I presented the start and the reality of the instruments, uh, and this was proved it helped. And then we forwarded to the Minister of Health. Uh, actually, it was something which is it inspired me. Once it reached the Minister of Health. Uh, the Minister of Health appreciated this innovation and I was awarded uh, a certificate of innovation and the contribution in the nursing profession. <laughs> Up to you see on his beginning that um, it was not by himself and he has to work with other people around it and you have to like, so you find a solution, I mean, you find a problem or a challenge when you're working every day and then you go and study so increase the knowledge of yourself and then um trying to find a solution and he involved a lot of people there and start doing the study comparing you know like before and now with this new innovation and then start seeing that you're saving lives so from 15 percent to nine percent i mean that is a great great drop i mean yes every baby who is uh, lost because of that is too many However, if you are cutting it down, and I'm sure the more improvement and resources, if we get them, then it's going to make it even better to try and save these um, babies of these new uh, premature babies. So, I mean, that is how a bedside nurse can start doing those things that help everyday nursing clinical practice 
and then um, improve patient care. So that is a huge, um, um, uh, oh, sorry. that is a huge um, um, asset for Mr. Wilson and the hospital, and of course in the nursing profession. And I'm sure people everywhere um, in Tanzania may be able to use it once it uh, becomes available, or the resources are poured into the project and become available to even remote area. And I think one of the important things that he mentioned that um, that in innovation that can be used in a remote area. And that's mm -hmm. where the babies, we lose a lot of babies because they don't have resources. Those moms don't get to the hospitals to deliver those premature babies. So mm -hmm. symptoms start so fast and then they go to these closest dispensaries and then they can't make it to the bigger hospital and baby pass. And then so having an um, innovation like what Wilson is saying, it's a huge, a huge addition to the uh, nursing clinical practice. And so we let him continue um, after he comes back. But um, for Dr. Elise, I think it will be almost a similar question. You're in a different level because you do have the knowledge and um, education and you've done a lot of research. So imagine the first day you started doing research, what prompted you to do research and what pushes you to do that? And what were you trying to accomplish? Yeah, that takes me back about 26 years ago. Um, at that point, I was already a lecturer, so I knew what that was about. Mm -hmm. I was already a uh, working clinical area, so I knew what that was about. I was a, a short stint of being a, a, a matron, which we called the, those days, or administrate, nursing administrator, and I knew that wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. So what I said to myself, I'm curious about what is research. Uh, I want to know more about that. And then I saw a, a post advertised for a research nurse or scientific officer uh, with regards to bipolar disorder. And because I had my master's degree in psychiatric nursing, I thought, I know, at, at least I know that. And I can draw blood because, of course, they wanted, it was a genetic study, so mm -hmm. it was a lab-based study, so they needed blood. And so, so I applied and I got the job. And then I really realized what is research. I, I fell in love with it because of, you, you get to ask questions all the time. You're never satisfied with You've got this answer and now the, you know, now everything is sorted. So from an inquisitive nature, I always want to know what about this, what about that? And that was, that inspired me to know more and to, to be able to, to do more. Because if one aspect of a research question is addressed, there's always, in the process of the research, there's always new questions arising. Um, and that inspired me. That's how I got to, to be there. And the other reason why I stayed is because I wanted more people, more nurses to be, to know more about research. I realized, but there's a, there's a career pathway that nurses do not know about. And, and when, when I spoke to my, my, my colleagues in the education field, they couldn't understand my, my enthusiasm. And I thought, but let, let me be the person who, who's the, the, the cheerer on of clinical research nurses and nursing uh, to open up a path, a career pathway. It's not just you stumble across something that needs to be addressed. It, you make it your business to do research and to do it well and to to do it on a on a big scale. And I'm I'm sure I'm not even answering your question because I'm now in my excited space. <laughs> so ultimately. <laughs> What got me there was I wanted to know about research and then I stayed. Okay. Thank you. 
So, um, so as a, a nurse, let's say when you started the first level of nursing, um, the first uh, time you went to the program of nursing, who inspired you to get uh, to be a nurse? And what made, um, what helped you make a decision that I do want to be a nurse? Yeah. I don't think I, I wanted to be a nurse and I didn't know it was called nurse uh, when I was three years old. Wow. <laughs> My, um, because then I started to, to be, a, to be caring. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it at the time. Um, and so when I, when I realized, but I had to choose to what to do in life. Um, I always said to, I want to be a nurse. My mother said to me, are you sure? Are you sure you wanted to carry people's bedpans? Are you sure you want to wash other people? Are you? And I was sure. But so she was, they allowed me at those days, you could still do, I think what they call these days are job shadowing. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... I was in I was in matric. I was in grade twelve, and I went to a hospital. The, the hospital then in Bloemfontein, where I did my studies, allowed people and uh, students, uh, matric grade twelves, to come and work in the hospital. I think it was for a month. So we we got our uniforms. We got everything. It wasn't just you walked around. You, you stay, we stayed in the, in the nurses' uh, uh, residence and, and they placed us in a ward. And for a month, we were nurses. And that just, before that, I knew I wanted to be a nurse, but that sealed it for me. And, and it was really, why? Because I, I, I contribute to people. I make a difference to people. I care for people. I could um, console them. Um, that's my why. You know, and that's why I became a, why I chose psychiatric nursing. Later on, um, after I've had my master's degree, psychiatric nursing, after I worked in the psychiatric hospital, life happened and I <laughs> went back to general nursing. Um, then I worked in a small hospital, like I think 40 beds or something. And there I had, you know, in a small hospital, you have to do everything. I knew everywhere I go, I used my psychiatric nursing all the time. You know, it's not just psychiatric patients. Any person has... Yeah. So in that hospital, I had to deliver babies. And I was super scared because what do I know? <laughs> Delivering a baby. And that's again where I knew, but I'm... Yeah, I had my midwifery book next to me in the nursing station and when I didn't know and the matron wasn't involved um, around to tell me what to do I I studied I I did my research in my in my books I in the end I delivered 40 babies and, and, and I started to love it so I knew if, if I wasn't so, if I did my midwifery as it was designed when I was a student, because I did, I did, um, I was a bit naughty. I didn't do all the things I needed to do. I, I, I did a couple of things that I cheated, to be honest. <laughs> while I was a, if I, I really did my midwifery the way it was designed I might have become a midwife because I loved it I loved to, to 
to be with the mother, to deliver the baby, to, um, yeah. But my why for nursing is to, to care for people. Well, so that's very good. Um, and usually those are the questions that um, we ask people who are still undecided to choose what. And because remember, if for somebody who is not a nurse and they're seeing nursing from outside, they will see how the nurse behave, how the nurse provide the care to somebody else. And, and they will see how much the knowledge the nurse has on when they're teaching the patient, especially maybe if they have a family member or anything else. So their perception of nursing, it will depend on how the nurses we behave in front of everybody else, being professional. Okay. So then somebody's gonna say, oh, I like to be like her or like him because they took care of my fa family member or my parents or whatever. And then at least they'll be like, yeah, I wanna be a nurse that way or somebody inspire me to be a nurse. So yeah. that put the pressure back to nurses that, so if you are a nurse, you have to know that every single time you show up there and introduce yourself as a nurse, you have a responsibility to be able to hold this profession at the highest. Meaning you have to care yourself professionally. You have to know how to behave and respect the patient, regardless of if they can pay or not, regardless of the diagnosis, regardless of their behavior that brought them to that uh, hospital. It does not matter. You have to t treat them as a human being first and save life. And then, um, so it's always, if we behave like that, then yes, we're gonna be inspiring the new generation to come and, into nursing. And those are the people who are gonna learn to come and take care of us. So I appreciate yeah. when you said, um, you use your psychiatric experience when you're working in another general unit because you do need that. You can't say, oh, I'm labor and deliver in a so med stage or medical surgical unit is not for me. No, yeah. in labor and yeah. deliver, you are going to get a patient who is require medical surgical information, I mean, care, even if she's pregnant. Oh, the person who is pregnant needs psychiatric, um, psychiatric care. So you have to have that diverse background to be able to function wherever you are. And the way you behave on those areas is going to help um, inspire people who are observing or watching you. So I appreciate that point definitely. And especially, even, go ahead. Even, even when I was working, now you must know, maybe part of who I am as a, as a nurse and as a person is I'm, I'm, I'm challenging myself. Mm -hmm. And that's where, <laughs> where the... Challenge yourself to, to know about others, other areas of nursing and life as well. I worked in an in a ICU, a cardiothoracic ICU, mm -hmm. which when my, my fellow educators who had their masters in intensive care, they said to me, Elise, I know that they knew something that I didn't know. But even in that, in the ICU, I used my psychiatry, psychiatric nursing, because people get, uh, they hallucinate, they get frustrated with, it. so it's, it's really a nurse is a nurse and a nurse is a caring nurse everywhere. Even, even in research, when I had to consent the patient, I would, I would counsel the patient. I would listen. It's not just come and sign to agree to, to participate in the study. And because I need to get my job done, I need to get this consent form signed. It is about what are you dealing with? Why are you not taking your medication? What, what is battling? What are your worries about going, what's going on at home? Why are you not using your your yogurt with your pears, a spe specific drug for TB that Catherine would know about. A nurse is a caring person wherever you are. I agree. Miss okay. Catherine, oh, Mr. Wilson, you came back? Yes. yes. Okay, um, so we did, um, we just recap from what you were talking about and then um, let me know if you still had something else to say. We were discussing that your innovation will benefit, um, especially the remote area where there's no, you know, like um, electricity or um, so then they can be able to use that. 
which will help to, um, to help those new premature babies, especially if mom is in the remote area and they have any complication during the pregnancy. And then they will run to those small area to go and have a babies. And then if those hospitals or small areas, um, clinics um, or dispensers don't have those resources using your um, improved CPAP, so then those babies will never make it. And then so um, that is a huge uh, contribution on your part to the nursing profession and those helping those babies. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add? Um, yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, anything to add is that uh, I always advise young nurses, uh, even from degree level or diploma, diploma, should be innovators. Innovators does not depend more on level of education. Uh, you can become an innovator just on what you are doing for your patient. Mm -hmm. uh, especially, we have to improve in patient care through documentation. As the previous I have said, uh, most Tanzanians do document just as a report. For example, a nurse can report, I have fed a patient, uh, I, I have monitored the vital sign, and ended at that situation. So to become an innovator, is an issue. As a nurse, you have to give up a solution. For example, if we say maybe uh, a patient uh, have conversion, uh, maybe you give phenobarbital, uh, you keep in safe environment, tell us as a nurse, what is continue to be is either to keep NILPA or, or make sure the environment is safe, or you have to give your suggestion so that at a certain period, you will be able to evaluate what you have planned. So through that one, you can become an innovator because you will pass with the situations that you have planned will lead you either to study more or just to rethink, just to rethink, for example, uh, Maybe uh, you are dealing with a patient with pain. Uh, and you know, maybe pain relief, well, you can give Panadol, or you keep environment safe. Uh, also, you tell the patient to stay uh, in a quiet environment. But if you come later to evaluate and you find that the patient is still in pain, you, from there, you can start to think, why I'm trying to leave pain, but the pain is still there. So through that, you will think and you can come up with a good solution instead of just anything you see for the patient immediately, you report to another side, for example, report to doctor. To me, the doctor will come and he or she will think the solution for that one. Because we are not documenting, we are not planning, something can become to become an innovator. So through this one, let us document, let us plan, let us use the proper nursing process and let us diagnose our nursing process. That is, thank you. You, you reminded me um, when I'm working with students, um, nursing students, we always keep saying nursing care plans. <laughs> Yes. When you have your patient, uh, I know as soon as I say that, everybody's like, ah, I'm like, no, 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 no. Remember, right now you're doing it on the paper because you don't have that clinical um, uh, reasoning yet, or you have not developed that critical thinking yet. When yes. you're working as a nurse, that care plan needs to be on your head. The patient complain or uh, report um, any concern, that care plan needs to start working on your head. And then so you can devise some interventions and then come back and evaluate to see if it works. Like what Mr. Wilson here is saying, identify pain. Okay, what kind of pain? When did it start? What alleviate? I mean, you have to ask those questions because those answer is gonna guide you to the interventions. What are you gonna do now? And then once you give the medication, you need to go back and explain, I mean, evaluate. Did it work? If it didn't work, what are you gonna do next? And then, so if you find maybe every single time we give a Panadol for half an hour, 45 minutes, it still doesn't work for this diagnosis. 
Maybe we should investigate for a different medication that might work even better. And that is the research right there. So doing things that works is going to support what you can do um, to a patient and make it better. And then um, I said, I go back to Mr. Wilson's um, innovation. I mean, those are the bedside um, innovations. Those are critical for patient safety and saving the patient's life. Um, so as a nurse, any nurse can do those research. Yes, you might, not, you might not do those full-blown research to win you $10,000, $100,000, but if you will research all your innovation, save one life, you have been a nurse because the nurse is usually the healing power. So let's just focus on that part. Like do the little things that every day you do at work. It's going to save life. And um, we always get excited to get uh, nurses doing research. And that was the only way it's going to help our profession and make sure our profession has been known for the contribution in the healthcare. And as I said before, and I always say, without nursing, there is no healthcare. Sure. Even if they don't believe on us, they, without nursing, there is no healthcare. COVID has been put all that thing in widespread. <laughs> When everybody else is sick and running and everything else, they are like, where are the nurses? I'm like, oh, really? No, you know where the nurses are? But anyway, so <laughs> those are the things that as nurses, we have to take pride and engage in our um, uh, clinical care and take care of this patient and then increase our knowledge. Like what Wilson was saying, going and study. What Dr. Elise was saying, go and study and increase your knowledge. So you can start, I mean, ask those questions, why? Don't be satisfied. If somebody say, we have done this for 10 years, guess what, those are your 10 years. I'm gonna do something different. Yeah. So being proactive and ask questions. You know, you're not being rude. So if somebody said, oh, stop asking questions. Um, I'm gonna say, uh, well, I went to school. I have my license. I have the right to ask the question because I'm not going sure. to get open pace. So, I mean, those are things that as nurses, we have to be proud to be able to say, we need to do this. So I'm so happy to hear them. I'm going to let Mr. Katunzi just join us. Uh, he was one of the panelists. So if you can use maybe like one minute to introduce yourself and then we're going to ask you questions. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I should say sorry because I had an emergency because I'm at work. That's but okay. um, I, I want to join in and I should congratulate the, um, the topic that was being discussed. To introduce myself, I am Katunzi Talema and I am a nursing officer currently doing my internship. And I'm a nurse leader, I'm the professional author and the pioneer of various nurse platforms in Tanzania. So I'm so happy to join you right now. No, thank you. Welcome. So um, I know you have done uh, a number of things for community outreach, and that's the part which I was trying to make sure as nurses or as prior nurses to know that there's so many things as nurses we can do. Um, so if you can tell us what um, activities or programs you have done as a nurse, I mean, oh, sorry, intern um, in the community. Okay, yes, I have done a number of community activities and uh, many of the community activities that has, has been done is massive screening on non-communicable diseases, giving a health education about reproductive health to the communities, and as well as teaching about the hygiene, especially to the children of under five, specifically on the area and how the mother should take care of their, uh, of their children. And then above all, I have been uh, involved in on bringing out some solution in the community, depending on the various portraying um, situation that is really happening to our Dodo uh, communities. And uh, all of the activity that I've been doing is being associated with affiliation with the other professional cadres, and I usually start as, uh, as a nurse to intervene and to bring out the nursing care in terms of community health nursing. So these are some of the community activities that I've been doing and so many have been moving around the country and especially in these rural community areas. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Katunzi. Um, with another thing I believe you have done, you wrote like a, um, two or three mm -hmm. books. I'm not sure. Um, if you can give us the real synapse just to um, inspire people to write books and tell us why did you think of writing books? 
uh, and contribute in the nursing profession? And uh, what inspire you or what um, push you to writing books? Okay, well, thank you for the very nice question. I was really this question because uh, it is one of the driving intent that uh, is resting in my heart and uh, I feel proud of it because I was able to make it happen. And my idea of writing the book at first was uh, when I was at medical, when I was at nursing school, I was seeing people from other professionals, I mean, medical students, lab scientists, students, other pharmacists, they were writing books. And unfortunately, I found in my faculty, there was nobody who was writing something pertaining my profession. And uh, when I was going to the clinical area in classrooms, I found that we had a lot of problems and yet they were not documented. From there on, I had to uh, ask myself, why don't I do this? And actually I tried to approach some of my fellow, my colleagues who had done it from other professionals. They didn't show me the maximum cooperation. And then I said, no, I have to start it anyway. For from there on, I produced it, the first article that was speaking about nursing profession. And actually when it was given out, I saw it really bring out the positive impact and so many people were like trying to congratulate me from what I did. And from there on, I said, no, if I was able to bring a try to the article and it has brought out the sound, the sound, the sound to the, to, to the community of the book. And from there on, and I produced the first book, which was about nursing profession. So from there on, I've been producing and writing various books. And now I have produced three different books and I have published the, like uh, four or five articles in various uh, platforms in, in, in within the country and outside the country. And as we are speaking right now, I am in negotiation with some of the local magazines or the uh, newspapers here. So I'll be producing, I'll be starting to give out my, my weekly uh, notification about the health uh, situation within the country and the, even outside the country. So I'm, I'm really proud of it because I started from the scratch and now I'm, I'm, I'm getting the, the, the more popularity from the work that I'm doing and I'm so much determined I just want to be to the highest level. So in just a summary, I can uh, simply elaborate that in the next shoes started from uh, now. I, I'm so proud of what I've been doing. But not only about writing and producing the article, I do also have been participating in, uh, in the non-communicable disease project where we will recently publish a paper about our findings. So uh, um, the reason that we, um, I wanted him to share um, his passion and motivation of writing books about health or nursing um, as from standpoint of as a nurse is just to show the diverse of the, our profession. Like even you are a nurse at the bedside, the experience that you have, the care that you have, the education that you have every single day, you can inspire other people by doing innovation, by doing research, by writing books. So the person who is not a nurse yet can look at those things and say, you know what, I want to be part of that because I can go in and find something to do and be able to do it and contribute to the nursing profession. Because if we don't share these experiences, people are going to think, okay, if I am a nurse, I have to work in the hospital. Uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, I work in the hospital for 20 years and I love it every single oh, day. Man. So Working in the hospital is great and then add to it so then people outside can see. As I said, it's unfortunate with the pandemic, but the, from the stand, pandemic standpoint, the response that the nurses got from it is like the more exposure and how much nurse is needed to take care of these patients. So that's when people realize that the nurse can do so much than that what they thought. So having the diverse group of the panelists today, um, you can see how much people, uh, how much nurses can do. and. Hopefully we inspire two, 10,000 million to come and join the nursing profession. So that would be great. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Katunzi. Um, Basically, I was like to ask to Fungameza about the sustainability plan of that device because the device was seen to improve the neonatal health. I think there is 
a need of sustainability and how to scale and the government contribution is there any agreement that this device will be known as a routine resuscitation device to a neonato do you have uh, that plan so the country will scale up okay thank you actually i have that plan and my dream is to use this device uh, if possible, all regions, those are found in Tanzania. Uh, I have been closely communicating with the Minister of Health, especially the directors of nursing, asking for when are we starting to train this device so that it can be used throughout of Tanzania. Uh, I think always there is a, anything has a process. Actually, in terms of approval, uh, uh, in our host have been approved, and also the ministry uh, has approved. The problem is where financial or oh, financial problem. Where how now are we going to start to train, uh, especially for those who are coming far away? Uh, only for those who are managing, for example, there are some regions, as that I have said, those are found in Tanzania, Katavi. Uh, they have sent two doctors and they have came and I have taught them on how to, to, to make it and to use. And at the end, they can help to solve the problem of Leonardo respiratory. This is syndrome. Uh, the plan is just to teach all nurses and the other health workers on how to use so as it can save more life and reduce the number of neonatal deaths. But always the main obstacles is financial fund. I don't have fund that have become a problem. That is. That is your wish, but, right? <laughs> if, if we can get the money somewhere. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, so I think through the communication, conversation and um, exposure, hopefully, um, I mean, few things can be made and then um, more discussion will be had. And then so that we figure out what we need to do first. But as I said, the training is gonna be important, especially yes, if you, even if you get those devices, somebody needs to know how to use it. And those nurses need training and ongoing training, not only just initial training, just ongoing training, maintenance training, safety and, um, and um, ongoing uh, uh, training for those people, I mean like super users to go and train and train every single time so people can maintain the safety of using those. But those ba babies do not have um, um, second chance. If you make a mistake in the beginning and you didn't do it right, they're already um, gonna be in trouble because they're already compromised. So they do need somebody who knows how to use that improved CPAP to be able to help those, um, save those lives. So thank you very much. Um, we still continue discussing that and see what um, things can be done. Um, I see Dr. Uh, Gwen Randall came back. So if you can say hi, and then um, we're gonna ask you a couple of questions. Hi everybody, sorry I'm late. Oh no, that's okay. You were here before and then you had to Yes, listen. I was. Okay. Um, so just, yeah, just give us a little, like a one minute thing um, of you <laughs> and then I have a few questions for you. <laughs> okay. Um, I've been an anesthesia provider for 25 years. I'm currently the assistant program director in an anesthesia program at Union University. Um, and, uh, I've pretty much done everything. I've been hospital administrator. Everything that needs to be done, I did it. <laughs> Excellent. So I wanted you to um, give us an option because since the, the today's uh, conference, we were talking about um, inspiration. So things that you have done in your nursing journey or educational journey that could inspire somebody else. So you are uh, right now um, a nurse and anesthetist. So with a PhD. So I wanted you to give us just a little 
let's say I'm brand new person, I'm thinking of being a nurse, but I have no idea where to go. And then so hopefully after your explanation, I might choose to be in an anesthesia or this someday. <laughs> okay. Well, my journey, because my husband was in the military, my journey has really centered around that. So when you move from point A to point B, and you see that there are other opportunities available to you, then you explore those opportunities. So my whole life has been um, around that. Initially, I wanted to be a physician, and then I pushed myself so hard in undergraduate school to hurry up and get finished. Then I was accepted to medical school, and then I just wanted to like, okay, I'm finishing in the summer, and then two weeks later, I was supposed to go to medical school. So I'm like, well, I, I, need, I need a little bit more time. I'm not ready to do this yet, right? My mother was like, this is what I tried to tell you. Take your time so that when you get to the finish line, you're able. So then after that, I um, basically, I got married. And then my husband was in the military. So I got transferred to Virginia Beach. It was an opportunity there. So the one thing that I never wanted to be in my life was a nurse. I can tell you that because my mom was a nurse and I'm like, I don't want to be a nurse. And so full scale, here we are, you know, I ended up um, because of circumstances and where I was and the opportunities that were available, I ended up going to, to nursing school after I already had a degree. And then that basically just opened doors for, for other things and then end up how I ended up being a nurse anesthetist was I was a hospital administrator. I didn't know anything at all about nurse anesthetists. And then I ran into one of the nurse anesthetists there who was a sole provider. And then he opened my eyes to, to that field of anesthesia. And then I and said, okay, well, I'm a critical care nurse. I have been a critical care nurse for 10 years. And requirement was you need to have two years of experience. So it's like, okay, I guess I'll explore that. So that's how I got to be where I am. And then I was um, teaching and uh, at the university and then had the opportunity, a grant came along for uh, individuals if they wanted to continue teaching. And there was a grant available for potential faculty to get a PhD. And then that's how I ended up getting my PhD. So it's always about exploring options keeping your eyes and ears open to opportunities and taking advantage of those opportunities when, when they come along. And that's really what, it, what it's about. So you kind of decide what is it that I really like to do and then what mechanisms do I have available to me to make those kind of things happen. Thank you very much. Um, and I do like that, um, yeah, maybe nursing was not, um, a part that you were thinking of, but um, just the event to prevent itself and you choose to do that. And yeah. look where you are right now. You yeah. are impacting the world and global. Yeah. Um, and um, speaking of the global, you have done things outside the United States um, into Africa. So if you can share a little bit what you've done and what inspired yeah. you to go to Africa and do that. Yeah, um, there was an organization that I was affiliated with. And so the uni, um, Addis Ababa University, they had a very, very strong, longstanding um, nurse, well, nurse, but anesthesia program, okay? And what they were saying is that because they all work for the government, that in order for them to advance and make more money, that they needed to have an additional degree. So they contracted I guess, or basically asked somebody from the United States, would they come over and help them start their master's program? And I happened to be the first faculty to go over to start their master's program. And then I went, it started in October. So for four years in October, every year I went to start a class. So it was interesting because the first class that um, I started was all of the faculty from the, from the college. And so that was very interesting because they were being, uh, you know, in instructors as well as being instructed by me. And so what we able, were able to do is to go in, identify some of the strengths, the weaknesses of, of what they were doing, try to give them ways to, to do things better, but also trying to work within their own confines. Because it's very, 
cool to go in someplace and you have all these big, great ideas about what we do in the U.S., but the reality of it is, you know, when you give all these things, like you're asking about equipment, if you uh, negotiate or you have donations made, then what happens to that equipment? What happens to the individuals who are responsible then to take care of the equipment? So I think that in some sense, Americans have a kind of, um, I guess, warted idea of how do you help people? You help people where they are and you help them to advance to higher levels, but you don't go taking a whole bunch of fancy stuff over there that they're not gonna be able to use or maintain. And so what I tried to do was just like, okay, this is what we don't have. The one thing I noticed is that, you know, you take the patient out of the operating room, you have peace people who are in quote unquote recovery room, which is not really recovery room. And the key is to get that patient out of that room as quickly as possible. So 10 to 15 minutes, they want the patients out, they want the patients back with their families. And so then I follow the patients and the patients are then given to their families, wrapped in a blanket, they taken upstairs to a room, and then basically they have all this food and everything ready for the patient when they come to the room. That's not how it's done. So we started making um, you know, pre-op rounds. We started, I got lab coats for everybody to have people you know, basically instill professionalism in them. Then we started doing post-op rounds because when you do an anesthetic, you also need to see how that patient is faring once it's done. You just don't drop somebody off and you never see them again. So with doing post-op rounds, then I was able to find out that they don't use narcotics. What do you mean you don't use narcotics? And we don't want people to be drug addicted. Well, then you have to understand about the physiology of the drugs. And so one thing kind of just led to another. And that program, I tell you, is just thriving like you wouldn't believe. Um, they're now, some of those students are now in a PhD program. So it's just a matter of actually going in, identifying, and then they actually being able to spend some time because when you go over and you are there two weeks at a time, you really can't make any kind of impact if you're only there for two weeks. So I stayed six weeks at a time. Um, and so you're able to really kind of make an impact and then communicate with people to say, okay, well, how are things going? And are you coming back? Well, yes, I am coming back because I want to see how you progress. And so now they have a PACU, they have everything that, you know, basically you really need to have in order to really care for your patients because giving an anesthetic and then dropping a patient off and giving them to their families is just not how it's done. It's just not how it's done, you know? So that, and then the, the other thing is to, you know, to say that, well, Ethiopians, you know, we expect a certain amount of, of suffering well, when I saw a 21-year-old that have a high incidence of, of abdominal cancer in young population. So when you see somebody who's 21 years old and they're flailed completely, you know, cut from sternum to pubic, and you say, okay, well, we, we, we don't, I said, well, we're, how are you going to take care of this patient's pain? Well, pain, well, uh, we, we, ex we expect to have a certain amount of suffering. Well, this is not suffering, this is torture, you know? So then I went USA ballistics, if you will, <laughs> and said, you know what? There, there has to be some pain medication available. Well, you know, like, I, I don't know, I don't know what you are talking about, but we use we used tramadol. Tramadol is not something that you can use intraoperatively with somebody who's completely open. You cannot. So the course, by the course of the day, they got some narcotics from somewhere. I don't know. I went into a really American hissy fit and they were able to, to get some narcotics from somewhere because I'm saying it's like all a matter of how you titrate it in. Okay, if a person is a virgin, if you will, and a person has never been exposed to narcotics, well, then you don't just, you know, heavy, you just kind of titrate it to see how they're going to respond. But you can't expect somebody who's been on the table for X amount of hours to wake up and not have pain or that pain to be okay. That's suffering. That's not, you know, so those are the kind of things. And then to be able to operate with, with generators. I, I mean, it's just all kinds of things. How do you do that? How do you do those things and successfully? One day I was in the middle of an operation of a little baby, you know, was having a, a neuro case done, you know, shunts put in. 
and we lost power. Okay, so what do we need to do? How do we continue to keep this patient safe? Because really at the end of the day, it's all about patient safety issues and how you're going to deliver those, um, what you do and making sure that the patient is safe, not only in your care in the operating room, but also that patient is your patient from the time you establish what we call a relationship with that patient and interview. Well, what do you mean you don't interview the patients? The patients just come to the OR. How does that work? How, what do you know about the patient? You know, if they speak all these different dialects and coming down from the hillside and countryside and all those places, then how are you going to communicate with that patient if you don't speak that dialect? You know, so all of those kind of things kind of you know, came into, into practice. It's like, it's not, this is just standard practice. This is standard the way it needs to be done and that's it. And so that's how that happened. And so from that time on, I've established a pretty strong relationship with, with the, the people in, in Ethiopia and just haven't been able to go back just because of, of uh, COVID, but I'm still in communication with them. And, and like I said, the program is thriving. They're having people come from all different areas uh, where before, you know, it was pretty much just uh, Addis Ababa University and the people within that area. But now they're having people coming from all over the place to, to take part in the program. And the interesting thing is that some of those students from those programs have gone back to their respective areas and they've started programs. So the program is just blossoming, but basically blossoming according to standards. And that's what needs to be established is there needs to be some standards and then somebody needs to you know be responsible to kind of know what standards are and then start to implement some of those standards and that's how you grow and glow and become more successful oh thank you very much dr randall um i know you mentioned um a few things but one of the things that i'm always um excited and looking forward uh, when we go to Tanzania next time. Um, it's um, attending patients in the operating room. When the nurses know the expectation before the surgery, during the surgery, and after the surgery. So if the nurse knows that cycle, you will be able to prepare that patient very well. You educate before, you educate during, and you educate afterwards. So then the patient is going to recover quickly. So what yeah. Randall just explained there um, when she did an, um, um, at the suburb is to make that program to make it becomes more basic care for a patient who is going to experience um, surgery. So those are things that if we empower nurses who wants to go and do um, surgical, becoming a surgical nurse, so then definitely you need to know the process, what exactly it's going to go through for the patient, find those uh, uh, consent before the patient get to the operating room, make sure the patient is ready, and then know what is the uh, surgery is done, what body part is affected, what organs is affected, and then evaluate afterwards. So then you can make sure the patient does not eat. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, those, those kind of, yeah, those kind of things. It's like, you don't have any information about your patient at all. So how can you provide an anesthetic, yeah. you know? So it's things that, I mean, as nurses, we need to know and learn and empower ourselves. So you go to a certain area, learn as much as you can to that area and make sure the yeah. patient is safe. Yeah. And so that is great, Dr. Rando, and thank you for sharing your um, experiences and um, things that we can learn from it. Um, do we have anybody with question for the panelists? We're getting close to part one, um, ending for part one, and then we're gonna continue tomorrow for with more questions. Anybody from the audience have a question to the panelists? I think we start. I am Pendo Mata Joseph Kibongoto, which is in the northern part of Tanzania. I'm happy to meet you with you and have learned a lot. Yeah, we can, can hear, you. hear me. Yes, I can yeah. hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I said that I don't have any question. I mean, like. I have learned a lot from the panel okay. from the panelists. Yeah, they have shared their journey, and they have learned uh, like those who uh, from Fungameza, from Tam, uh, Katunzi. Uh, what have 
they have really, I have really been impressed is that someone can do a lot if we having the tendency of ask, ask, ask mm -hmm. yeah, from what he is doing. Like you are doing something to care the patient, you have to ask yourself why and that in that way you can you, know, you can be innovative so it is uh, it is good to uh, to advance your education like you to get some degrees but it, even if you have the first degree you can do something with the, the knowledge you have so that is very important i think for young nurses they can learn a lot also they have something to do uh, and also we have learned also people, they need mentors because you find people, they want to advance themselves, but they need someone to like to mentor. Uh, you find like the way Fungameza was sharing, like he, he was using some... expertise uh, and sharing. He was like interesting in what he was doing. That's when uh, he was able to to do to do some uh, to innovate and come with that uh, bubble sip up. So I think that is good uh, to have that tendency of asking and also to be innovative. And also I think for those who they have already maybe have PhDs, it's good to mentor young, young nurses uh, in their in their area because you find some people they want to stretch themselves but they don't have someone to pull, I mean, like to pull and, you know, support. You find like for clinician, they have, there is a lot of, of those who have uh, been educated, but for nurses, you find we are like, okay, there are few those who are educated, but again, they, they need to mentor others so that we can have most, uh, most of nurses, they advance themselves. Thank you. Oh, I, I agree with uh, the mentorship part because that's a big <clears throat> thing that we're doing here in the United States is mentorship programs. For an example, um, there are a lot of specialties that people of color here in the United States really don't know anything about. And that's because the people who are in those positions don't reach back in the communities and mentor those individuals. So I think that now we have this worldwide connection, if you will, um, via Zoom, via internet, for people who are in different countries to be mentored by people in the United States and to help them set up, or wherever, to self help them set up programs to advance their own practices. Because sometimes it, you can start small and then expand because you can just say, okay, this is what I need to do. You gather a group of individuals from your perspective area, you sit down, you do some you know, team building, talking about what we want to do and how we can do it. And then you get somebody from the United States or wherever to kind of mentor you through that project. So it's almost like doing a research project, if you will, you know, here's here's what I here's my question, and how am I going to answer the question? And so that's what you have to do. You know, within your own uh, confines, to say this is what I have to work with. Now, how can I get from point A to point B? Even sometimes, if, if it's getting donations or maybe writing a small grant or something. But there are are mechanisms for you to advance your practice. You just need some help and and direction in being able to do that. Yeah, I agree, Dr. Gwen. Thank you for sharing that part. And uh, Ms. Pendo, thank you for your um, summary of what you have um, observed and learned today. Uh, going back to Dr. Elise, um, remember she was talking about in the beginning about the mentors, the same thing. Um, yeah, so as a QHSC, um, I think that's one of the idea that um, we are going to start doing is, um, and then um, Ada post the list of um, people who are um, expert on their own area. And then so list there and then people who are young in the um, profession. And if you're looking for a specific area, then you have a list of people that can you can access and be able to say, okay, if I'm trying to be a uh, nest anesthetist, what are the things that I need to do? What area should I focus? What right question should I ask? 
you know, to in, um, get into the appropriate program. I have this innovation. Where should I go? What funds or what resources can I access to? So those are things that we can start doing it with using you. Um, you guys are panelists of experts, so we can start listing the names of the people, allow people to be able to uh, connect and networking, to, at least to help each other. And that's how we're going to build our nursing profession to inspire others. Because we, I agree with Dr. Rando, yes. People have the um, expertise and everything, then I stay on my own. I don't share anything else. So if, let's say, people is interested, I mean, somebody is interested in labor and delivery or um, maternity uh, or obstetric or pediatrician, or pediatric nurses, and then I just keep quiet. Nobody's going to know, okay, maybe I should ask this right question. Maybe I should do this because they've never contacted somebody who has the same interest in that area. And then, so I think to make a more accessible, it will help people to say, okay, let me find this information. Let me try to see if I can get more information from those areas. So I think that would be um, a great um, asset and we can start that um, as soon as we can. And then we post it and see how many people we can reach uh, and try to support uh, the men as many as we can, knowledge-wise, um, guidance-wise, and then clinical-wise to see we can improve our nursing uh, globally. That was a very good idea and very good suggestion. Okay, so I, as I said, as we're getting close to the end of um, the first session, so I'm just going to give the panelists chance, like just a little bit, if you want um, to give or to provide as we get ready for tomorrow. Let's start with uh, Dr. Elisa, are you there? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. So to provide for tomorrow, it, it, there are more to discuss about research mm -hmm. um, and, and specifically in, in, in Africa where there's, a, there's not a career pathway. So maybe we could start to look tomorrow about what will it take, N not, in, not in terms of the, the, the nitty gritty, but more in an overview, what will it take to, to establish a, a clinical research, um, I'm going to call it a career pathway, but it's actually bigger than that. It is um, a, a, frame of, a frame of mind, a, a mission that nurses stand together in, in, in Africa to promote clinical health research. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. It seems, it seems that, that there okay. are pathways for physicians um, in Africa um, because it's, especially the major universities, that's kind of some of the stuff that they're doing. However, if you're talking about, are you talking about a global initiative? Or are you talking about just initiative in Tanzania or what, what exactly are you um, thinking about Dr. Lees? I'm, I'm talking about Africa. Each, each country in Africa, um, there's, there's, there's all these uh, universities and uh, local research organizations, mm -hmm. meaning established locally in, in countries that do research. Mm -hmm. And instead of being called the handmaiden, that, you know, the field worker, and instead of not being your name on the paper because you just collected the data and, and not having that. So nurses, that's one, there's a career in that. There's a career, there's an organization called the International Association of Clinical Research Nurses. And as you know, in America, there are career pathways for clinical research nurses, which they are not in, in Africa. Um, so that's what I'm talking about, to, to cultivate the, the, the research as a career and research as a career pathway for clinical research nurses. Every, every nurse wants to become, wants to, to have evidence-based practice in, in, in Africa. But the capacity to know how to get from A to Z in, in doing that, we, we, need, to, we need to establish 
a, a career pathway and also a, a mentality, a, a framework that we support each other, that it's not just me sitting here at the tip of Africa in South Africa and saying, I want to become a PI, PI but nobody around me is there to support. And, you know, so that's, it, it's all. In fact, I actually, now that I remember, I actually tried to start an organization around in, in 2018, 2019, uh, which, so I've, I've got a, a business model I've got a proposal, a research proposal actually written that just needs to be taken further. Okay. But that's a conversation for, that's a whole two days conversation on its own. Yeah, it is. It I is. agree. Because I, I think that, um, you know, you're talking about now going to a whole different level when we need to get people to even start thinking about evidence-based practice, what does that mean? How do I do it? Then you can take it to the next level. So if you want to, to start any kind of research initiatives, then it needs to be that training and building them up to get to the point of doing research and not just doing research just because, right? No, no, so no, I think sure, no. it needs to be a... Um, a mentoring process to even start talking about what is evidence-based practice? Exactly. What are the elements of that? What do you need to do? Um, and yeah. you can do research without being a PhD. You know what I mean? Yeah. No. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. And then you're right, Dr. Grant, uh, Randall, that's what we were dis discussing earlier today um, with Mr. Wilson. And yeah, so it, he has an innovation of um, improved CPAP and we we're like, yes, it doesn't have, you don't have to have, um, uh, master's PhD or even bachelor to do it, but it's just the inquiry mind. Like you want to be investigating why is the care like that. So that thought is going to help you push you to do more stuff in there. Of course, with the guidance of people who can um, direct you on the right path to be able to get your okay. information written in a way that you can be um, either uh, used or utilized by other people. So definitely you might need um, networking with other professions. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, Mr. Wilson, anything yes. that is gonna, we're going to carry until tomorrow? <laughs> uh, Guys. Let me see. <laughs> what you is that? Nesn will be involved on what we do and right and not what we know. That is the message of today. Okay. That's very good. Short yeah. and clear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Randa? Yes, you're ready. Um, I, I would just have to say that we just need to build up a, a team of support to, like you said, I think mentorship is, is my big thing to help people get to where they want to be and help mm -hmm. people to um, identify you know, struggles that they have within their own institutions or within their own country, things that are, you know, more um, pertinent to those particular countries. How do we help you do better? Or how do we help improve patient safety in your particular areas? That's what I think it needs to be, a mentorship program needs to be set up so that we can identify some of the problems and work with people who can, institute some of those changes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Catherine, our moderator. Um, I have nothing, but I saw Fatina and the par Maybe they can say hey and where are they? Fatima? Hi. Hi, Fatima. Hi, Hi, yeah, I listened to everything. It was very, really, really, really great. Um, I did learn a lot. <laughs> and that's my first time being in the in the this panel. So it was very great. So I am here in um, Cincinnati, Ohio. I am a nurse here at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. And I work in the labor and delivery unit. I used to work with Harriet. She was our <laughs> educator. <laughs> and, 
Yeah, so it was great to be part of this uh, debate and I did learn a lot. And I thank you all for, uh, for all the debates. It's very resourceful and uh, very helpful. And okay. I thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, is Mr. Brank? Can you hear us? Hello? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, so um, anything that you learned today or you took away from this discussion? Uh, yes, there's a, a lot of work to do for sure in terms of the, uh, I guess, organ organizing and building uh, support networks um, for for those who are interested in, I guess, seeking an inspirational pathway, and then even those who um, have already started on it, like the the gentleman, um, I, th I think you said it was uh, some kind of innovative CPAP or something like that, or? Yes, Mr. Wilson, yeah. Yeah, so I missed part of that, but it sounds, <laughs> sounds very interesting. So, but I'm not sure if he's going to be, is he going to be in... Uh, Dodoma? Or? No, he's in Dar es Salaam, oh, okay. mm -hmm. oh, well, maybe we'll get to um to 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 to, to meet him and see it. Well, we, we have to arrange for that. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. uh, he's talking about the medical mission. In two weeks, we'll be going to Tanzania uh, for medical mission, and um, we have a lot of um activities schedule and Dr. our very own Dr. Gwen Randall is going to be teaching some of the, um, one of the education there. So we are via virtual, so we are so excited. There's a lot of, Mr. Cartoons also is going to be there volunteering. So there's a lot of excitement. But um, anyway, so um, I don't want to take any more time and I just want to thank you everybody um, who came. And I know a few people, kept texting me that they have um, issue with the internet. Um, some of them couldn't go through, but um, they will end up getting the, um, the recording. But we're gonna wait until we finish tomorrow and then we can put both of them, part one and part two together. But I wanna thank all the panelists for taking the time to come and share your um, nursing journey. So we are trying to inspire new nurses to show them uh, why we chose nursing and what do we do in nursing and why do we enjoy um, being nurses? So a nurse is a nurse, yes, but a nurse also comes with a lot of responsibility and um, to what they do every day to ensure patient safety and um, save people's life. And um, so the nurse is the first person to these patients and the last person to this patient. So the more we know, the more we can save their lives. So we have to be proud of our profession and so we have to learn as much as we can and be innovative, like Mr. Wilson there. Be um, research, uh, <laughs> like Dr. Elise. Be um, uh, global um, outreach uh, extraordinaire, like Dr. Rando. So all those things we need to do. Be um, community um, um, outreach person and authors like Mr. Katunzi. So all those things, I mean, we have all those researchers, all those um, nurses who can do more than um, just being at the hospital. So the more we do, the more we can enrich our profession and make sure everybody knows about it. So we have to work together, start that mentorship and be able to support each other so we can help and grow and continue to inspire and save lives. So um, if nobody has anything to do, I wanna thank you again. And um, again, welcome to the second part of QHSC tomorrow's um, conference tomorrow, and then we can, Continue with our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Oh, if everybody wants to be, I can go come to the. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. There we go. Oh, Dr. There she is. Pendo, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> okay, good. So everybody can wave and then we can take a screenshot when we finish it. Okay. Are you there, Mr. Prank? You're the only one who is in there. Yeah, I am, but you um, you, okay. you muted my video, so I can't uh, I can't what? come back in.
Yes, you can. Okay, hold on. Let's go. Okay, it's going to okay. start in two seconds. Start my video. Here we go. There you go. Okay, so everybody, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you. So we see you tomorrow, guys. Thank you. Okay. Okay, how about you, Bye. Sanzuri. Ah, Sanzuri. Okay, bye. 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 Elizabeth Adu Gayamfi. Elizabeth graduated with her degree from Hunter College in Canada in 1998. She then got accepted in the University of West Ontario for public health. She took her electives for her post iron program and got her grades up to where it needed in order to enter the iron program. During that time, in 1998, Ms. Elizabeth received her LPN license in Canada while she was still finishing school. She worked for an agency where she had the opportunity to work on several med surge and geriatric floors before she was allowed to officially give medication. In 2000, she received her RN license and entered the summer program at the Western and then received her BSN from the University of Western Ontario in Canada in 2001. Elizabeth worked in the level two labor and delivery from 2001 to 2007 at Credit Valley Hospital in Mississauga, Ontario. Then UCMC level three labor and delivery from 2008 to 2018 as a bedside RN and then clinical team lead from June 2015 to September 2018. She then entered the Family Nurse Practitioner Program in October 2015 at Chamberlain University. She graduated from Chamberlain University in August of 2018 with her MSN FNP certified in 2000. She is currently working at the UC West Chester as a charge RN on a labor and delivery. She started there in 2018 to be closer to home and to look for an NP position. Ms. Elizabeth has worked on various projects at both sites and implemented new guidelines to improve patient and RN safety. Let's take a moment to recognize Ms. Elizabeth Adu Kayanfi and give her a warm welcome. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming and welcome to the first our new QHSC inspirational pathways of um, nursing conference. So today is part two. We started yesterday and uh, we met um, global panelists, Mr. Wilson, Dr. Gwen Rando, Dr. Elise, and um, Mr. Katunzi. And then so today also we're gonna add there to the list, Ms. Elizabeth Adugamfi, and she is gonna be um, talking to us and joining that panel and sharing her academic and um, nursing clinical practice and all the achievements she has done through nursing. Um, so we, from yesterday, just a recap, we learned a lot from the global panelists. Um, one of the takeaway was um, developing mentors. So as nurses, for those people who are fortunate enough to have those experience and advance in their uh, degrees, we are asked to be mentors to the new young energetic nurses so they can come and enrich our nursing profession. So creating that um, link and try to inspire new nurses to do more than just um, nine to five job, which we know nurses 12 hours or eight hours uh, shift, but we need to uh, inspire nurses or young nurses to do more than what they do every day. To, to think beyond, to be a critical thinker and think outside the box and seek um, assistance or knowledge to empower themselves so they can improve the nursing, um, sorry, they can improve patient safety and then improve the uh, working environment. So another takeaway was to um, encourage nurses to engage in the um, clinical nursing research. 
So by engaging in instance research, that also is going to add to the uh, profession to be able to find ways, effective ways to take care of our patients um, and um, ensure their safety. And then empower them, um, ourselves to be more motivated in seeking information, learning uh, from others and collaborating, networking, all those things were discussed yesterday. And um, so I am gonna um, invite right now to Miss um, Elizabeth to say a few, just a little greeting, like a one minute greeting, and then we're gonna come and start asking questions for what she has been done in nursing. Miss Elizabeth. Hi. Hi. Um, so, as um, Harriet's told you, my name is Elizabeth. Last name is Adu Um My background, I went to school in Canada. Um, I started as, a, I guess, a nurse's aide, um, STNA, um, while I was in school. I basically, I really didn't start out in nursing. I really wanted to be an OB doctor. <laughs> my mom was um was actually a midwife um, went to school in england and was a, a labor and delivery nurse herself and then be, we came in midwife learned in england and then i went to with her to when she went to go do home visits and deliver babies in homes mm -hmm. and then when i went to go see her do her practice i really enjoyed how she took care of patients and then basically followed her and then I, by watching her and how she took care of patients, I wanted to be an OB doctor. But then I realized that OB doctors are not the same as nurses because they were invested. They just didn't come and see you for two seconds and then leave you. And then seeing how they were vested and took care of patients and how they did more research and took care of um, their patients, I wanted to be a nurse. And my dad actually actually more like steered me in that direction and taught me that you know you actually are more vested in your patients and and that you are you get more insight into how you care for your patients. And so I started as an STNA, then I kind of went into the LPN field as I was in school, and then I got my um associates, and then I got my bachelor's, and then actually my husband was the one that actually steered me into getting my NP. And I did labor and delivery for 20 years, and then I got my MP, and now, right now, I'm still in labor and delivery and looking into actually working in an OB office to become an MP and still working with um, OB patients. So that's my background right now. Um, I've done, I actually worked with Harriet for a long time, <laughs> and that's how I got to know Harriet pretty much in the OB field. So that's my background. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Um, Elizabeth. Um, Ms. Pendo? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, yes, I did work with um, Ms. Elizabeth Adugamfi and for almost 10 years. And so we enjoyed working labor and delivery, and we saw a lot of um, diverse in um, our level three uh, obstetric units. And, um, and we learned quite a bit to work in a team. Because remember, nurses don't work by themselves. So we work in the teams, working with the doctors, different departments to be able to ensure um, uh, patient safety. And so later on, I'm going to ask Ms. Elizabeth to explain one of, one of the projects that she did in uh, um, nursing clinical practice to ensure patient safety, especially for pain management for those patients who cannot have the routine pain um, um, management in labor. And uh, Dr. Randall he is, um, is going to be here also. We'll know what Ms. <laughs> Elizabeth is talking about because usually we always work with um, anesthesia to uh, medicate patients in labor. And there are a few choices, depends on the um, pre existing condition on the patient. So um, I will ask that Ms. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth to explain to that a little bit in a few minutes. Uh, Ms. Pendle, you want to go ahead and um, continue with the discussion? Yes. Yeah, sure. My question goes to Miss Elizabeth. You can okay. Miss Elizabeth, how are we in are we going to motivate nurses attitude to read to read the literature? How are we gonna motivate nurses to to read the literature? Because <laughs> a 
in order to conduct research, nurses have, we, we have to develop attitude of reading to nurses. So how are we going to motivate them to read literature? How are we going to motivate them to read to read literature? Yeah. Yes, like a, like a bedside working every day just for their shift. So how do we get them motivated to read literature or evidence based to improve their care or to think beyond of just uh, bedside uh, patient care? You have to make them a part of the bedside care. You have to make them think outside the box. Um, you can't just let them, you have to make them feel like they are part of the care and a part of the improvements. When you don't make them feel like they are part of the improvements or, how, or show them how the literature affects the patient to make the improvement better, they don't see the outcome of um, the change. Um, I find that when we make, it's the same thing as when you show the patient how an outcome of one situation is. So like when you go from A to B, if you don't show the patient how they're involved in their care, just the same thing as you don't show a nurse how uh, they can make a patient feel better or how a care or a practice makes one situation better, then they don't see the outcome. But if you show them how the outcome works by the literature, where the literature is, is um, a part of that, like the improvement is there, that's how you make them want to read the literature because the literature, you have to show the proof of the literature. That's the only way you're gonna make them read the literature or how the practice is important. Because even like, even with the COVID vaccine right now, a lot of nurses don't buy into the practice. You have to show them that you can buy into the change. You have to show them that this from A to B becomes C. And that's the only way you're gonna be able to be able to make them read the literature because you have to make them buy into the practice. You have to make them buy into the change. If you don't buy into the change, they're not gonna to wanna to read the literature. And that's, a, that's what we're finding a lot nowadays is that the only way for people to buy into that, you have to show them that, that this practice does create change and that it's safe for the patient and that it's safe for the practice. When you can't show them that this, that changes can be made, they're not gonna buy into it. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Elizabeth, um, for your comment. Uh, we do, um, like one of the example, um, Usually, if you introduce new um, activities, or the nurse has been done doing the same um, uh, practice, the same over and over, like what Mr. Wilson um, was talking about yesterday, was that if the nurse um, asks to do a task, give a medication, a pain medication to a patient, so then the nurse will do that, and then if you ask them, I mean, again, do the same medication two hours or six hours or eight hours. They will do it without documentation or proper documentation. So you can see if the medication is working or is not working. So if somebody comes in with the evidence base saying, you know what, if we, if we have to document before medication you give, after, evaluate after the medication, and then that is going to improve patient care. So then we know if the medication works, so we need to change a different medication. So with evidence based, then they will see there's a changes. But the nurse is not going to buy into that unless you show them that okay, using the evidence base is going to improve. So next time when they're doing their nursing practice, they will be able to say, let me find more literature supporting what I'm doing right now, or can we do it better? So then they will go and be um, inspired to go and do that. But if they don't see that the evidence base is going to change their practice or improve that practice or make it easier, <laughs> they're not going to do it. Right. Yeah, they're just going to leave it that way. Right. Especially when there's ob obstacles in their way to make it not make it easier for them, they're not going to buy into it. I think the same question can go to Dr. Gwen Rando. Yeah, um, I, I, I would add to that by saying that when you get the staff together to identify problems that they have seen and problems that they want to work on, um, that also encourages buy-in. When, when you make them feel like they're a part of the process, that mm -hmm. also helps a lot. So, you know, getting together, I mean, in, in nursing meetings, 
um, and things like that and start to get people to think about, you know what, what is it that we're doing here that you guys would really like to see changed? How can we work on that together as a team? And again, it's about the team buying, getting the buy-in, not from one person or two people, but actually from the team and the team starting to work together and challenge each other. Even if you have, um, you know, what we call rounds where you can post uh, an article online or something, have everybody read it and discuss it and then come up with solutions. So I think it has to be the team for the buy-in and not just individuals. Thank you, Dr. Rando. It's true that nurses, I mean, one of the things to motivate nurses to lead literature, they have to see the rationale of reading literature, if it is useful as you said. So if they don't see the it is useful, they have a proper rationale of reading, they will not read, definitely because they know that they will not use what they are reading. So they have to know uh, what they are reading will be useful in their daily practice. Another question, uh, before I ask another question, do you think there is other ways we can motivate our nurses to read literature? Other ways of motivating them? Because you find like in our country, nurses, they don't read like you find there is a lot of uh, policy guidelines that have been distributed, but the nurses, they have maybe uh, some procedures book, but they don't read, they don't review. So do you think there is other way we can motivate them? The experience I have, like in our country, we, when we have introduced the IPC, Infection Prevention and Control Guideline, a new guideline. But the people, they have uh, the, book, the guideline in their words, but they don't read unless you, until maybe they are invited to a training, that's when they, they get orientation, but they have the guideline, but they don't know what is inside the guideline. So do you think, uh, in which ways, again, we can motivate such nurses to read literature? Uh, the same question uh, maybe goes to uh, Wilson from Gameza. Uh, are you asking in which ways nurses may be motivated in order to read the research or publications? Yeah, not only research publication, but you find there is guidelines that have been distributed like the IPC guideline, infection prevention and control guideline, the new guideline that has been distributed in our country. But you find nurses, they have the guideline, but they don't know what is inside the guideline. They don't read unless they have been invited to the training and then they have been trained what is inside the guideline. Do you think okay. there is other way we can motivate nurses? Okay, thank you very much. I think there are different ways on how nurses may be motivated, uh, on how to read either guidance or publications. One way is to make sure these nurses who are, are able or are going to conduct, for example, who are going to read, should, should be recognized, or oh, for those who are publishing, should be recognized either by peers or by the management. Uh, I, I can take uh, an example if someone either is trying to publish, if the, a certain management or institution recognized either by award or enemies, it means that that nurse, she or he will be motivated to read more and even to publish. So that is one way, just recognition. Uh, another way, what I see, uh, should be conducted the frequently training. Uh, as you know, nursing is a continuous process. Uh, if 
unless get a lot of trends, this sometimes may make him or her uh, to read on what she or is supposed to do. Uh, another thing is to allow this nurse to participate in scientific conferences. Uh, through this, a nurse will be motivated himself or herself also, uh, even to read, at the same time to publish. Uh, apart from that, what I see also, there should be avoided some biases. Uh, this comes when a nurse maybe try to write uh, a, a certain proposal, then it comes on the way of reviewing. It comes a problem that comes that uh, maybe a nurse is not considered that she or he can uh, publish uh, a certain book, for example. So. If there is a bias, that nest will be demoralized and he or she will not read a job. Thank you very much. That's very good, um, Mr. Wilson. Um, I know um, Professor Katie Kaiga, she was, she was going to add it to it and then I will send it back to you, Pendo. Okay, everybody. Um, I'm lucky enough to be, <clears throat> excuse me, working with Harriet at this time um, in, in South Florida and such. Um, <clears throat> what I think about this is we need to bring this in school and start this early on so that and have them understand where that comes into their practice. But if we don't have that in our nursing programs and that they understand and it's not it's a good thing research because they take the research class and then they look at me and go, oh, we have to do this. <laughs> they said, yes, we do. And we're going to get into good discussion. And once they do that, they can see more of the benefit of it and see more of the benefit of where can we use that in our nursing practice on the different units that we are in. But I, I, I believe, and I've seen it through the years, that if we are positive about it, if we bring that into their practice as students, that will kind of start that into their practice when they're working out on the units and everything too. And then participate in those group meetings and participate, you know, here they're always looking to go to magnet status. So really trying to get the nurses involved in it but if they don't get it from, from when they're in school, and if they don't see the positive about it when they're in school, they're not going to embrace that as they grow in their nursing practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kaiga. Ms. Pendo. Okay. I, I would just like to add to that in saying that it has to be incorporated that this is a profession and not a job. And so if you're just going to work, then work is different than being a professional. When you're a professional, you have accountability. And with, I think also in stressing that this is a patient safety issue. You're responsible for the patient. How can I provide competent, safe care to my patient if I'm not read and to understand what it is I'm supposed to do? So I think you're absolutely right, um, Katie, where it really has to be addressed early on that nursing is a profession, lifelong learning. It is not a nine to five job and then you're done. And so that's where the initial buy-in has to be. The mindset has to be, be changed, um, you know, and, and until we're able to, to do that, and, and basically it's just all about patient safety. And if you get people to understand that you have to buy, provide patient safe care, then maybe you can start to make some inroads in terms of you know, wanting to read the literature and having discussions about why you're here and what you're expected to do. So it's about expectations and accountability and not just a job. I agree with you wholeheartedly. <clears throat> I would also say I like in my lectures to be able to say, 
things that we did 20 plus 25 years ago that we're not doing now because of research and because of nursing research and how things have changed because of what we have done as a profession <clears throat> to make it better for our patients, much more safe for our patients, as you just said. I also wanna to add to that. The thing is you should also not just know your policies, but you should know how you should be caring for your patients in regards to the new literature and what's safe out there. The thing is your policies are gonna guide you, but you should know the guidelines too, because they're always changing. And the thing is you need to know professional practice for not just nursing, but for the physicians as well. So the thing is you can't just go into your job just to do your job. You know, you need to know what the literature is saying because you're not gonna go in there and just increase medication just for the sake of increasing medication. What are the guidelines? What are the safe practices out there? Because it's not just your license on the line, it's your patient's life on the line. So safety practices, you must know what you're walking into regardless, because it's gonna change for you. And the further you educate yourself and the further you go back into school, it will change as your profession changes. And as you further along your education and you become whatever you decide to come, as you go back to get your master's or whatever, those guidelines change as your practice changes. So you have to know what you're going in, what you're walking into, because the, the, you can't just go in there and say, that's what my policy said. But what does the practice say for the patient and what, do, what are you supposed to do? You know, guidelines are guidelines, but you have to know what you're doing at the same time. And what does the literature say? So, you know what I mean? You really should know what you're walking into and you should really know what those practices are today. And you have to keep up on those things and know what they are. So we, the thing is, I loved research when I was in school. You know what I mean? And most people who are going back to school today are like, I don't like it, but you need, you need it. You need to know how to be able to look things up and know what, they, what the guidelines and the research are staying today. You know, so the thing is, you, you have to know these things. You cannot ignore them because they, are, they will guide your practice. Well, guidelines are guidelines, but then from the guidelines, they be standards. What is the standard of right. care? And right. so guidelines are great, but they're also yeah. your practice needs to be based on standards of care. Right. And then that's why they are always arguing, you know, that's what the guidelines, yeah, they're guidelines, but they're not standard of care. And that's what they keep, oh, they always want to say, this is the guide. No, those are guidelines, you know, and they're, they're, but they're not standard of care. And I love how the nurses will pull out, but these are the guidelines there, but they're just, guidelines are recommendations. They're not standard of care. And they keep forgetting that. And they like to cross those things over every single time. And they keep forgetting, but those are not the standard of care. So. Thank you, Ms. Elizabeth. Um, Dr. Elise, I know you wanted to say something in the middle there. Dr. Elise? Yeah. So, so in this conversation, I actually hear a gap. And, and if I think of what Mr. Wilson said yesterday about innovating a physical equipment, there's actually innovation to happen it sounds to me because who likes to read the policies? Who likes to read <laughs> guidelines? <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> but if there's an app, if there's a, a, a infogram, which somebody needs to keep up to date because I don't know about in, in you know where you are, but policies change and guidelines change and so there's actually a gap in the in the market, am I going to say, for to support the nurse to read, to be up to date. And to be up to date is to read. So that's one thing that I want to say. And the other thing is what I usually do start with, I start with the early adopters, people who are eager to read and get them to get their fellow nurses or colleagues to be enthusiastic about knowing more. Because ultimately not all people like to read. That's just, some people just want to do. So it's, 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 and that's what I'm, so get people 
the one teaches the other. And in the teaching happens the, the, the knowledge that I know I have because I need to tell you about what I know. And the other person in the questions, I get to know what I don't know and don't know. And the other person has the same. So just, so that's just what I'm hearing in the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Elise. Catherine Kitiga is one of the moderators. Do you have something to say or ask? Hi, everyone. Hello. Yeah, thank you for the recommendation given by the expert. Uh, I was thinking in different way. Uh, almost nurses always think of salary. So if you come to say, we have to be update, we need to read, we need to intermingle with other professions. They like, they don't see like it is important to read literature because they came out with the conventional method of just demonstrating procedures they taught from the universities. So I think we needed to have influence them at least to change their mindset. If their mindset will not change, they will continue practicing as the ordinary ways and there will not be changes. That is the perspective of where I'm working here in Tanzania. I see them, if you go further for, for you, you are interested to read literature, they just say, why are you reading like this? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think I mean to add to what Professor Kaiga was saying uh, in response to Ms. Catherine here was, I do agree with you. If they don't see the value to it, they're not going to read. And if, for example, as I said, even if I go to read, uh, what is going to be different? If I don't read, I'm getting the same thing. If I read, I'm getting the same thing. So what's the difference? But yeah, so if we introduce that thought that, you know, like you have to work with evidence-based uh, the evidence base have to guide you. So the um, research have to guide you because whatever you did 10, 20, 30 years ago, it's not going to be the same as today just because of the advancement and availability of resources, whatever is here now. So we have to change. Um, the same thing like Mr. Wilson innovation the, of the uh, improves um, that was sip up. What we did care for those newborn or preterm um, newborn in, 10 years, five years in Tanzania, it's not going to be the same from five years from now with an improved um, CPAP. So you have to adapt with changes. If there's another technology comes or research comes, then we have to improve our care and move to what is current. So yes, it is very hard to change the mind of people who are already working right now, but if we can go um, the new nurses and introduce it in the school, when they come to the clinical practice, then we have that different perspective. And slowly it's gonna start changing the um, pendulum to move to more people who wants to read. Uh, because it is hard to convince, uh, to convince somebody who has been working there 20, 30 years and their ways of doing things and they're still doing it right now. It is a challenge to any administrator <laughs> of working in a clinical area. But what about, what about patient outcomes? You can do the same thing 20, 30 years, but how do you evaluate, Ms. Catherine? How do you evaluate patient outcomes? I do agree with you without an updated practice. Uh, if the outcomes is not monitored of what you are doing, it will be very difficult either to say this is because of the practice we practice or because of it's kind of, it's hard to evaluate for sure. I think we need to have a, a, a bit, a good leaders to, to, to influence this young generation nurses because changes are inevitable in this world of the science. Over. And I think um, to add to it, uh, Ms. Catherine, is what again Mr. Wilson was saying yesterday. 
um, that documentation. So what Dr. Rando is asking, like, okay, yeah, so if you want to measure the patient outcome, you have to show what you're doing now. And if there's a changes, then you can have something to compare. However, you're not going to have anything to compare with if you did not document anything that you have been doing that before. To, order, to, be, to say, okay, so with the new literature, this is going to improve whatever we have. Um, I like when um, Mr. Wilson said yesterday that his um, uh, improved double CPAP is going to improve the um, neonatal mortality from 15% to down to 9%. So those are statistics. So if the documentation was done, and once you improve care, you can show by using an evidence base, by using literature, by using whatever the technology, this is how many babies we're going to save. As I said, saving one life is better than, um, I mean, more than everything. So having those statistics in the documentation, we have to be able to document those things to be able to compare and improve our care. So then that's who we're going to be able to convince them by using this, by improving practice, we can also improve our patient outcome, like saving those babies' life. I mean, that's just one example of many. Uh, um, like what Catherine was saying, she mentioned something about leadership. Um, and I think the uh, the the remotivating, or like um, Dr. Harriet always says, without nurses, <laughs> there is no healthcare. I believe if I said it right. Yeah. Um, so it, it's it's about making nurses, and I'm not a nurse, so excuse me, <laughs> but letting them know that you guys are the greatest and the best, and making them really proud of themselves. And then, as Catherine said letting them know that just as all of you in your own right are leaders, so are these new younger nurses and healthcare workers who are coming up through the ranks, that they're, they're leaders as well. And if everybody's a leader or they understand their full potential, then um, <clears throat> maybe they won't become so uh, complacent in what it is that they do. And then they'll shoot for those standards um, that you were uh, talking about. And then, I, you know, so. Yeah, I think the explanation has to be taught from the beginning and they need to know what they start from. And then that's what, like what Professor Kaigo was saying, starting from school. So they know expectations and what are they shooting for? Like, this is what you learn. This is what you're gonna be following. And as you work, as your responsibility, professionalism, then you start have to, uh, in accountability, you have to be able to educate yourself every year. You have to attend certain things to be able to know where you are reading your policies, re reading a standard of practice to be able to improve patient care. And then of course, uh, ensure patient safety. So all those things, I mean, as an nurse, you have to be able to take on and know what you need to do from day one. The next question is goes to Elizabeth Adigaki. How are we going to develop a consortium that will help to build the capacity of nurses? What do you think? How are we going to develop a consortium for building capacity of nurses uh, to become researchers? We're going to develop a consortium that will help to nurses to build their capacity to become researchers so that they can contribute to public issues in solving those problems. So how- She said, how are we going to develop the consortium so that the nurses can become uh, researchers? It is is very low, but I think that's what she said, right, Pendo? Yeah, sure. Okay. I think it would have to start in school. I, mean, like, like, I agree that you have to take a look at the curriculum. Yeah, the curriculum. What, what is being taught and Right. Why do you want to be a nurse? Because I know when I was in um, Ethiopia, a lot of the people, nurses and other people, they work for the government. And so if you're a government employee, there are certain expectations, but you have to go above and beyond that. And so if you're only trying to advance yourself for the money, which is what I found when I was in Ethiopia, um, you know, you want to go to the next level, but it really is not about the professionalism part of it. It's because you want to make more money. Again, that goes back to you having a job versus being a professional. 
So I think you really have to look at the, the curriculum um, where you're actually ingraining into nurses, people who want to be nurses, that this is a profession and you have accountability. And it has to start there at the beginning. If it doesn't start there and you're just in the profession for the money, then it, it becomes a job. So that's one of the things that, you know, we struggle with even now here, even in the States where people want to be X, Y, and Z because they can make X, Y, and Z dollars. And it has nothing to do with them wanting to make a difference in practice. They just want to have money and lifestyle. And so, you know, it, it's, it's kind of the same, but at least here in the States, it is ingrained into the programs responsibilities of your profession and you're expected to attend meetings, you're expected to do CEUs, you're expected to do X, Y, and Z in order for you to remain accountable in your profession. So I think you, know, you have to take a look at that whole system and how you change because it just, it's not, it's a system-wide problem as far as what I can see. And so where do we, where do we impact the system so that we can change behaviors is what it boils down to. So I would think um, I agree in Sorry. part um, for some people, and especially if people have been working so long in the field with a different expectation. So there's a burnout, uh, that's not an excuse, but there's a burnout, right. people start doing things they shouldn't be doing. But no, I mean, right. we have to go back and encourage um, nurses and the majority of them, I mean, they're making the decisions because they want to go and provide care, which that's what we are gonna, uh, we have to like, aim and focus on those people who are able to, I mean, they chose the nursing profession for a, a good reason. Yeah, I mean, in any profession, I believe there will be some people who will go there, be able to learn how to take care of the patient. And then right. you get to be um, a nurse anesthetist, you better be very good because you're working with people like a small mistake, you can um, affect somebody's life. So you don't want just rush without critical care nursing, critical um, um, knowledge to be able to take care of the person who you are, have 110% total over it. So, I mean, there's a lot of assumptions that go through the um, nursing, but we are hoping that if somebody is making a decision to be a nurse, and if we are um, emulating the best examples of nurses, so then people should be aspiring to be effective nurses, passionate nurses, and then professional nurses versus the few people who are gonna mess up our um, profession. So the effective nurses or better nurses have to be louder than the people who are trying to dim the light of nurses. So um, we have to start in school. Ms. Catherine, you have a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. Be the leader. <laughs> right, Ms. Catherine? Yeah, I had all. Thank you. Uh, maybe you can ask a question. Yes, go ahead. I want to ask uh, Katie. Oh, Ms. Katie, yes. Can you tell us a bit about your journey, the challenges, and the way you overcome them so you can learn from you? Um, my journey through nursing? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I live in South Florida. I've done all my nursing in the state of Florida. Um, I started out, I wanted to be a physical therapist, and I didn't get in. Um, the best thing I could have done was go to nursing school and I um, became a certified rehab nurse. So I was the brain injury nurse. I took care of all the brain injury patients, helped open a rehab hospital um, in North Florida, um, did admissions. I negotiated contracts with insurance companies to get the best care for our rehab patients, brain, spine, stroke, all the heavy duty trauma patients and all. Um, I've run home care agencies and I've been teaching full time and I've been a certified rehab nurse since 1989. I started in rehab in 1987. Um, with that being said, I bring rehab into everything I teach and my students laugh. They're like, bladder, bowel, skin, that's all we ever hear about. Well, no, it's not all, all you hear about, but it's really, really important for your patients. And so I've been teaching and I 
love teaching. I absolutely love teaching because you bring everything you have with you to teaching all those different areas and you, you have that passion. And my students will say, you know, we can tell that you're passionate about what you are doing. You know, when I want to see patients get better, how do we do that? How do we say, how do we think outside of the box in order to get this patient who isn't swallowing? What are we doing? Who else do we need to work with in order to get that patient as functional as possible? Um, whether they're in acute care, whether they're in the home, wherever they are. Um, that's challenges. There's always challenges, but I think you have to be positive. I think you have to work with your team. You have to be able to communicate with your team and really work through that and, and figure out some of those challenges. Um, what I was thinking as everyone else was speaking before is having hospitals really embrace um, your nurses becoming certified. If they're certified in that area, they have that buy-in, they want that. And, you know, some of our local hospitals really recognize it and have, you know, certification week and they have posters up of who's certified and they have research day. And, you know, if the, if the institution itself also really embraces it, the, the um, nurses will also embrace it too. So I think some of it comes from the upper, upper leadership with that. Um, I'm on a unit right now and it's one of our grads. She said, I'm, I'm going to sit for the orthopedic certification. I'm really nervous and I'm really scared. I'm like, you're going to do it. You're going to do this. But, but that, you know, bringing that in and be, having more of that knowledge base you bring more of that to your patients also. And you know, that you, but I also think it comes from the, that institution that's really embracing what we're doing to help our nurses become better in those areas where they are, which includes research and such too. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaiga. That was an excellent um, response. Ms. Catherine? Maybe, yes, maybe Elise can add. If she has a different story, she can tell us also. I know at um, UC, we have like what we call clinical ladder that we do every year, um, where it allows us to do like research and um, actually let us be a part of like building our policies or creating new policies where we get to do um, research into adding like new policies. So like um, the one policy that Harry and I got to work on was adding nitrous, um, using nitrous oxide on our unit as another way of um, a pain relief for moms who can't get epidurals who are in labor. So Harry and I got to get to work on that one together. <laughs> And that was kind of fun. <laughs> we got to do some research on um, different products of um, nitrous oxide and which ones we can use. Um, it was a trial and tribulation, but we got through it and we got to, um, got to what, two vendors, I think it was Harriet? Yes. So two vendors that we got to um, kind of look at their product and we picked one. And initially it was a little bit of a trial because I think our hospital was dealing with one vendor. Yes. And um, initially the one vendor we were stuck with for a minute, even though we liked the second vendor. And um, I guess the one vendor, I guess no longer was making the product. So we got to keep the vendor that we wanted. And um, we had to come up with a policy. We had to come up with a contract with the patient in regards to using it. We actually got, we started from scratch, which was kind of nice. So we got to actually build up on our own policy. We got to build up on our own contracts. We got to do a lot of research on it, um, get some literature to back it up. It was really nice. Like it, we hit some walls and, but we were able to get through that. Um, we worked with anesthesia on it. We worked with um, maternal field medicine on it, the attending. Um, we, yeah, we pretty much did it ourselves <laughs> from beginning to end. Um, we got the nurses involved to buy in on it as well. We got a couple of the doctors, a resident, um, MFM with some maternal fetal medicine. And I think one of the attendings, 
to actually come in on this with us and work with us. And we, it was, it was fun for the most part. Um, a little trialing, but we, we got it done. And it was, we got to do a presentation for the unit. Um, we got the vendor to come in and show us how to use the product, um, how to protect the product from staff. Um, so no one abused it. We worked with finance to um, be able to buy what we bought, two machines. Mm -hmm. right? um, we did education for night staff. So the night staff was able to learn how to use the product. Um, so they were able to teach the patient and then day staff also got hours to come in and do that as well. Um, it was really nice. Like Harry and I got to team up quite a bit to get that through. Um, it was an option for those who like had um, spina, um, scoliosis who couldn't get, um, who couldn't get epidurals or for those who did, wanted another option to just not having to get an epidural. Or if they were transitioning and they went too quickly, that was another option for them as pain management. It was actually really nice. Um, it took us what, almost a year, wasn't it? Yeah, from it? yeah, from studying to training to research to buying the surprise and to training. Uh, and the training, I think we did almost two and a half months because you have yeah. to train every single nurse. Right, um, and physician too. Uh, yes, yeah. and physician, yeah. Yeah. So the whole and process took a year, yeah. Yeah, and it was a portable, which was kind of nice, so it can go into any patient's room. And it was a blend of uh, nitrous was 50% and oxygen was 50%. Yes. It was really nice. It was, yeah, a year, a full year of everything. And we had to go through the, the forms committee. We even had to go through, was another committee that we had to, we had to see? Also, you have to include a lawyer from the hospital to find the language because you, when you have a contract yeah. with a patient, um, right. it has to be included in patient care. But because this is an, um, an equipment that the patient is going to use in the room with family member around it, so you have to have a contract that stops the family member from helping. Right. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff. Um, so yeah. any um, innovation or invention you do in the clinical area, you have to pass it through a lot because the goal or the outcome is patient safety. All these things you are doing almost for the whole year is patient safety. Right, so like things like that, like those kind of projects where you allow the staff to be involved, that helps with the buy-in, that helps with the research. And like that helps them build on those policies because they get to do the research. And when you let your staff do that, that helps with a lot of the buy-in of letting them learn why um, uh, we're still saying that's what helps also with um, the buy-in of, you know what I mean, getting that everybody involved with the literature review and wanting to do the research. So, yeah. And if you start with, like I said, if you start in school, like letting them understand that, they want to be a part of it. Oh, go ahead, Luis, Mr. Wilson. Yes. Oh, in addition for that about uh, Jan, uh, even myself, I have a short story about nursing job now, especially nursing innovations. So please, can you allow me to display, because it involves some pictures that show me how I have come with some pictures. Can you allow me to show for a moment? Sure, let me see. I started innovation in 2015 during internship rotation at Mbea Zono Referral Hospital. I found that patients miss some essential care from nurses, especially continuous care and for up due to lack of nursing care plan and the appropriate nursing diagnosis as a guiding for nursing care. Uh, I decided to write a book for nurses known as nursing diagnosis as a guideline during nursing implementation and the documentations. Through this, Initiatives, the management of Mbeya Zone Referral Hospital through patron office, Mr. Thomas Isidori, believed on me that I can make changes in a nursing profession. They decided to give me a session with my fellow two intern nurses on every Tuesday and Thursday to teach all staff nurses on about a nursing process and a nursing diagnosis. We did this for one year until we completed the internship. Uh, in 2017, I was employed at Mwimbele National Hospital, Mloganzila campus, working as a nurse 
in neonatal intensive care unit. In 2018, I was innovated the so-called improvised bubble CPAP device that is used to treat newborn babies with respiratory syndrome, distress syndrome. Uh, this innovation is expected to be trained to all healthcare workers in Tanzania so that it can help to save life and reduce neonatal deaths. Uh, in 2021, I have managed to publish the book known as Nursing Diagnosis for Academic and Clinical Practices. And I will show you through the screen because I have this is special for all nurses who are working in clinical areas. Also for students, nurses at all levels who are studying as in college or university. But this book can be used by a tutor or a lecturer for teaching students on a nursing process and diagnosis. Uh, I was obtained from my innovation. I have managed to obtain three hours according to my innovations. The first hour was on 11 February 2001 about a certificate of recognition as a nurse innovator in healthcare profession from the Ministry of Health, Community Development, Gender, Elderly and Children. Uh, handed by the Minister of Health, Dr. Dolot Guajima, as shown below. Uh, here I was receiving a certificate of recognition as an innovating health professional, especially in nursing. Uh, also, uh, second award was on 23rd February 2001. About a certificate of recognition for creativity in nursing profession. Uh, this award I obtained from Muhimbiri National Hospital, Mloganzila. And the guest of honor was a chief medical officer from Minister of Health, Professor Abel Makubi. But due to the inconveniences represented by Dr. Koi, as shown below, that I was receiving a certificate of recognition as a creativity nursing profession uh, and the certificate itself thing. Uh, the last award from this year, this was the third award was on 12th May 2021. Uh, it was about a certificate of recognition at the National Nurse of the Year 2001 in nursing, in nursing Innovation. And this award was from the Minister of Health and the Tanzania National Nurses Association. Uh, the guest of honor was the President of the United Republic of Tanzania, Honorable Samia Sulu, due to inconveniences represented by the Minister of Local Government, Honorable Umi Mwalim, as shown below. So uh, this is a certificate of recognition and the best national nurse of the year in nursing professional innovation. Uh, in conclusion, if nursing continue to do business as usual, existence of nursing as we want it, nursing as a client need, it will cease to exist. And nursing will be continued to be valid based on what we do and the right, and not by what we know. Uh, thank you very much. This was just sharing your experience, especially in nursing innovation. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Uh, and the book, it's what I am talking is, is seen here. Okay. It is a huge book about nursing diagnosis. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, any nurse usually when they hear nursing diagnosis, nursing care, problems, <laughs> people will start getting nightmares about that. No, I'm just kidding. But um, it's always interesting when we talk about nursing diagnosis and you cannot take care of a patient without having a nursing diagnosis in your head and then formulate yeah. the nursing intervention so you can provide that care. There is no way you can um, practice without that. 
but I know usually through teaching, I know Miss Katie, we, <laughs> we understand there will be like student to wake up and why do I have to do nursing diagnosis? You do have yes. to do that. You might not need, I mean, like right now in school, you have to write it down. So the reason you're writing it down because you're trying to train your brain to be able to spare out all those things you're thinking in your head, write it in a paper. So next time when the patient starts asking you a question like that, you should remember, or you should like be able to respond with an intervention right then and there instead of looking at your book. So uh, practice, make it perfect. So um, for nurses, don't complain about the nursing diagnosis and nursing care plans. Those are the preparation for you to build up your critical thinking. So when you're taking care of the patient, you can think on your feet. And that one is going to make you an effective nurse. So um, let's work on nursing diagnosis. <laughs> okay, Miss, Miss Catherine or Miss Pendo, any questions to the um, panelists? Yeah, my question goes to Wilson from Mesa, what do you think have contributed to your success for young nurses to learn? Yeah, we want to learn from your experience. What do you think have contributed to your success? Mr. Wilson, did you hear the question? No, can, can, can she, you she repeat? Said, she said, what, have, what has contributed in your success for becoming a successful nurse? She wants the young people, young nurses to know. Uh, actually, uh, what is needed is self-motivation uh, and being focused. As yesterday I said that anything, what you do, it should have some obstacles, uh, uh, those we call challenges, but you cannot be disappointed. <laughs> And this I've seen for most young nurses, for example, they don't want to read different publications. And also, they, some, they say they don't have time to waste. So, if you have ample time even to sit with your phone to talk something, what about not writing about something? Uh, also, uh, what I advise for young nurses should should try to write different publications, including books, as well as research. Uh, and not be disappointed for those who are trying to send up. For example, the problem comes when someone is trying to write, for example, a publication, the one who is reviewing, uh, maybe there are some mistakes and this young, young nurse is asked to, to make correction. So uh, if you don't have self-motivation, uh, you cannot make those corrections. It means you start to neglect yourself. So the one is needed just uh, self-motivation as well as studying hard, regardless you are in clinical area or you are in a university. That is my contribution for young nurses. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask Dr. Yeah. Liz? Uh, thank okay. you so much. Hey, Liz. Yes, Dr. Liz. Can you respond to the same question, Dr. Liz? So what, what to, how to inspire new nurses? I cannot stress it enough that I'm going to call it self-generation versus self-motivation. For me, there's a difference between motivating yourself and generating yourself. Because even if you're not motivated, you can, you can generate yourself. You, you, you can cause yourself to be proactive, to be reading, to uh, innovate. The other thing is really to, to, to find where's your passion. You know, I, I, previously I said, who wants to read a policy? So, <laughs> find, to, to motivate yourself is to find where your passion in nursing lies. 
I was um, fortunate to have experience being a lecturer, working in the clinical field, a short stint in, in being a matron or a nurse uh, um, administrator. And I definitely knew that's not for me. And when I reached the, the being involved in, in clinical research, I, I arrived. That, that is my passion. So to motivate yourself and to generate yourself is really to know where's your passion. Um, and then to have a role model. You know, if you find somebody that inspires you, there's the saying that says, uh, you as best as the, the three people that you surround yourself with. So if you surround yourself with people that's not inspiring you, you're not going to be motivated. You're not going to be uh, inspired. And that's my, and, and give yourself, make it fun. You know, it's not a serious, I'm not saying nursing is not serious, but it's just giving if, if it takes hopping from one area of nursing to the other, to the other, go with that. J just make it a journey versus I've got to find a niche for myself. I've got to find a niche. There's time to find a niche and then you stay in that niche. I think Dr. Randall, you know, she described it yesterday, how she started off and where she's now it's really be with be with the journey be with the process um yeah that that's that's what got me motivated and keep me going for well since uh since 94 uh, 74 i i need to how many years is that and i'm still <laughs> I'm still motivated. I'm still, I, I cannot wait for the next nurse to, to ask me, can you please support me? Can you, can I please talk to you? Uh, because it's, it's a passion that's in me that I'm just hoping to share until I can't share it any longer. Wow, excellent. <laughs> that's very good, Dr. <laughs> It is. But, but can I, um, can, would you allow me just to go back to a previous question? Yes, please. And, and that's because that's my question. The, the question was, um, how are we going to develop a consortium to help build the capacity of nurses to do research? And research, uh, capacity building is my passion. Mentorship is my passion. And research is my passion, passion. <laughs> so inside the question of how are we going to build a consortium, that to build a consortium is important, you know, because we need to support each other as, as a global alliance to, to get research, to get research done, to inspire nurses. So my question is, what does the word consortium mean? What what is what is what do we mean when we say we want a consortium if that is what we want? What is it going to look like? It looks like a um, network for a nurses, nurses network. That's just the meaning of consortium. Okay. And, and a network of nurses who are doing research, a network of nurses who are diverse, who can bring innovation, who can bring finances, who, who can bring thought leadership. Or, and, and is it a formal structure? Is it a, because a network can be a loose structure. It can just be this is this could be a network. So what is what is the thinking behind the question? I'm curious about that. <laughs> the thinking behind the question is the that network that will work as um 
the, the the network that will guide the new generation on how to be uh, researchers. There must be always uh, people who initiate. They will try to write. They will try to look for the opportunities because we we will not all do looking for the opportunities. Uh, the essence behind the question is that. Yeah. I, I get that. I think also um, to add to uh, Ms. Catherine's um, responses, I believe the um, consortium will be like creating like a hub somewhere, for example, if I'm a brand new nurse and I have no idea where I need to go or which area of nursing I should go. So if you have somewhere where there's like a, um, a group or um, a network to a point that I can say, okay, let me go there and find out information. So in there, you find a diverse group of people who have different uh, focus. So then I can say, oh, so I want to be um, in a, anesthesia, an anesthetic. I want to be in academia. I want to be on the clinical side. I want to be, so at least you see examples in front of you and see which example mirror what you are passionate for. So I think probably it's like a resource somewhere where they can find that information. Because right now, because there's no, a bigger group that offer even that mentorship or even, I mean, if it's a specific area like a preceptorship, let's say if I find somebody who wants, I'm mean, doing very well research and I've never done any research, so I can go and uh, try to network with them or call them and contact them and see, get the support, how do I start that process? Okay, I find that group in the group of Dr. Rondo is there and I'm interested in to become a nest anesthetist. So I can go and ask, okay, what are the requirements? What are the things? What are the possible challenges so I can prepare for them? So then when you go in that group and find examples of what you can do, um, then it helps to increase awareness. Because right now, if a uh, majority of the nurses, at least when I was like 20 years ago, I was thinking a nurse is going to be at the hospital or residence, working with a um, um, resident area. And I did not know the nurse could be uh, more than that. That was before I was a nurse. So I joined nurses because I wanted to go and work in the hospital. But getting into the um, school, then I realized there's so many areas that you can do, including nurses who are working with the politicians, advocate for uh, those standards. So, um, but you have to have a group somewhere where those expertise and those different areas, they're there so people can have, um, I mean, they can find the resources to, for someone to see what area of nurses they can do. So it could be a group like that. And that's what we're trying to inspire any nurse. If you're thinking of nurse, then you can think beyond just um, routine things that the nurse can do. The nurse can do so much. Even run for president someday. <laughs> we can have a nurse for president. Well, there's a, there's a nurse now, a Kore, Kora, Kori, somebody, Kori, uh, that's, that's in parliament at the moment. In, in the oh, US. Nice. See? Yeah. We, should, we should get a <laughs> put in our group and be able to talk to them. No, I mean, for the young people, definitely they need to see that. And even people who are working in the clinical area, and if they're getting burnout or they've worked so many hours, now they want something to continue inspiring themselves or motivate themselves or do more for their profession. So they can have places where they can go. So you have to have people with different uh, groups. We have nurses uh, informatics, which they are talking about all the documentation and stuff. So those are things that we want to be able to put in out there. So any person who is studying working with the nurse, because they might start working with the nurse and they're bright enough, but then they'll be like, oh, I don't think I can work in the hostel. Maybe that is not what I wanted, but I still want to care about, about the patient. Okay, so maybe go in another way. Be an informatic to a point that you can help us document and stuff and make sure patient safety, I mean, so documentation is ensuring patient safety. I mean, we can have all those areas or go and be a legal area, next legal consultant. So you can come and advise us, documentation is important to prevent a uh, lawsuit and ensure patient safety and make sure the guidelines are in place. The workplace has abide by these certain guidelines to make sure you are safe. So, I mean, we can have nurses everywhere. Yeah. And in fact, to add to that, um, Ms. Kisa, are you there? Ms. Kisa Mokaringa, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so can you um, share your experience as a nurse, since I see you, you are a nurse informatic guru. 
<laughs> how is your contribution as a nurse help you to work as an informatics and um, how can we learn from that? Oh, okay. So good, 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 good evening. I think yes, this is good morning for people in America. So my name is Kesa. I started my journey as a nurse, like a regular nurse on the floor, and then become a head nurse supervisor, as, and then all the way to the assistant director of nursing. I'm based now on informatics. Informatics is like to make sure the documentation is accurate for all patients. So the care plan, as here you talk about the care plan, uh, patient care, and also prevent the legals, whatever legal aspect can happen, you want to make sure you're on top of the documentation. Um, so my role is really to support nurses. Like um, this patient you have, patient pain management is documented, but maybe reassessment is not done. Care planning, you don't have a care plan for this patient. Now, for example, we are going with the COVID. So COVID, the care plan has to be included in the patient. You're teaching patient, you're teaching the family, and... We recently have like our surveyors and they're looking for all this documentation. And then how you're gonna prepare the nurses is, is a lot behind the scenes. Some people, they don't ever ever hear about nursing informatics, but nursing informatics is existing. And how did I get to nursing informatics? You know, as you are nurse, people, they're looking at you as a role model. And then as a role model, how you perform your job. You could be in any area, but for me, I have somebody who I see her as a supporter who um, link from nurses and the IT team to create the workflow of how we want to run our hospital. And then I admire her. And then I went to her and then I said, I really want to know how you do this? Did you go to school? And she said, yes, I went to school. Which school did you go? And then I registered to school eventually. And then I, she, she, she was my mentor. And then from there, I enjoy it. I enjoy it because uh, I support the hospital. I support the nurses. And then I'm all over the place. And I, I, that's where I am. I don't know if you have answered the questions. Yes, yes, you did. <laughs> now, I was just trying to show the documentation how it's important. Um, and I'm going to ask Dr. Randall to uh, speak on that part, on the um, anesthesia part with the documentation, how important it is to make the nurse's job um, easier, safe, and patient safe um, safety also. There is no documentation. There is no case, period because we base everything we do on a patient's history, a patient's weight, and a patient's um, diagnosis. So if we don't have the proper documentation from their physicians or referrals or anything like that, then we cannot provide safe anesthesia to our patients. So documentation is, is everything in terms of how you deliver your care. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Rando. Um, I like that statement that, yeah, no documentation, no care. And um, usually the JCO um, love that statement. If they don't see it, it means you didn't do it. <laughs> and usually they start getting um, frustrated with that because they're like, oh, I was busy working, but how am I gonna, uh, how are you gonna prove that you did complete that care? Especially if the outcome is not what you wanted. Uh, mm -hmm. everybody's going to expect you that you have completed that care to make sure you provide um, safe care for patients. So if it's not documented, it was never done. And then so documentation becomes a very, very um, uh, safe um, uh, process to make sure you document everything that you you do so then you can come and um, support your patient uh, practice. Um, any other questions from Pendo or Catherine? I want to ask Kisa Makaling. She said she's in informatics. Uh, here in Tanzania, if you want to, to go with the career, the same career, it is not like advised to go to other field. 
like me now, I, I'm an epidemiologist. In my professional career, it seems I'm outside the, the professional. Now, I want to ask her, uh, is there any challenges during her thinking to be an informatic person? And now she can tell us the coming generation so the people may not confined to think that being a nurse is just a bedside thinking. Actually, nursing informatics uh, need you. It's, it's good. I mean, nursing informatics, once you have a background as a nurse, it's not only IT. So that's the first thing. So you have to be a nurse, and then you're going to go to nursing informatics. So there's a level of education. Uh, you can go by bachelor degree and master, uh, master's in, in nursing informatics. You're going to just focus on informatics, documentation, as a previous uh, uh, representative uh, spoke about uh, documentation. And um, that's what our main focus documentation, patient safety, the outcomes, the research. So, nursing informatics is include everybody, including infection control. So, we're not working on silo. We work with everybody. However, I don't know how it works in Tanzania because if there's a crisis, for example, like a nurse shortage, I can wear my scrub and then I can go and function as a nurse again because I still have to maintain all the license of the CPR or SLS. So you can do anything. And nursing is a big umbrella, very big umbrella. You where I am in the US, you can, I can work as an informatic, I can work as other, I can work in other department. I don't know in Tanzania, but however, we have to come out of that thinking that, you know, I'm um, epidemiologist nurse and then I cannot function in any other place. I think we have to, to let other know. And then I think this is a very good uh, platform for us to speaking. And then because we, it opened our mind that, you know, oh, I can be something else. I can be something else. And that's what I'm thinking. Uh, we have to think about that. Don't be stranded or be stuck in one area because you may go to that area. Like I'm going to go for, for example, I'm going to go to informatics. And then when I get to informatics, I don't like it. So how I'm going to get out from there? You, I can just say like, you know, I don't feel comfortable here. I want to go somewhere as a place. I think I can do better in other area. So I'm encouraging everybody, especially young people. Yes, you can do so many things. Nursing is a really big, big umbrella. As I, as Harriet, Dr. Gabon has spoke about before, that if she knew nurse is a nurse, but there's more than a nursing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I want to ask Randall, is there any impact of nurses having a low publication apart from improving patients' care and the outcomes? Let's say the question again. I, 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 I'm asking, is there any other impact or for nurses to have a low publication out apart from patient's outcome? You know, it's really not about the publication. It's a really about understanding what it is you're doing and how you can have patient, safe patient outcomes. The publication comes later, but you have to build the groundwork in terms of, you know, having a solid foundation as to the care that you're providing and then go to the next level to document that documentation of what you're doing and your successes and outcomes become a publication. So I don't think you should be so focused right off the bat on a publication. It's a matter of getting all the other processes in place so you can move towards publication because publication is really documentation of what you've done and the successes of what you've done. So don't get too hung up on trying to get the publications out there until you get the standards and guidelines and all those things in place. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
thank you. Maybe Pendo can add questions. <laughs> I like the response of uh, Dr. Rando that he, we need to emphasize documentation. <laughs> I mean, like if nurses they know the importance of documentation from the nursing school, that's when uh, again we can have also those publications because you, you cannot get data to publish if, we, if there is no documentation. So I think the documentation of nursing care, documentation of Clinical practice is very important. Yeah, maybe we can, uh, the same question that was asked by Catherine uh, can be responded by Katie. Katie, Professor Kaiga. I had a hard time hearing, hearing all of that. She was asking, she said, if you can respond to that question, she asked for Ms. Kisa about the nursing informatics, you know, like having a speciality within the nursing. Does that speciality put you outside or inside the nursing? You're absolutely inside all of it. Absolutely. Because the documentation, the more nurses we have involved in it, the more we understand and it's charting about what we're really doing not just charting, if it's just IT people that have no nursing background, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so we need nurses involved in that, in all the different areas, whether it's, you know, in the hospital, in the OR, you know, all of the charting is a little different. So we need the nurses involvement in all of that. Um, there's some, as, as, Kisa's involved in all of that, absolutely. Um, and there are nurses that have, you know, worked on the whole entire program for all of the um, informatics for the different different companies and such. And it makes a huge difference, huge, huge difference. A, a, um, another area for nurses to work. There's so many, like, like um, Dr. Gabon said, there are so many different areas for nurses to work. My master's is actually in nursing case management. Um, and managing groups of patients, groups of diagnoses, working with all the insurance companies and all. That didn't have, we didn't have that back when I graduated from nursing school in the early 1980s. It came about with all the changes with healthcare. So as time goes on, we have more and more different um, areas for nurses to actually go into and really work in too. And you bring all those skills with them um, to those different areas also. Yeah, if I can add it to uh, Professor Kaiga, um, answering the part of the um, informatics. So documentation, for example, when we um, um, started uh, using EPIC, electronic um, records. So we had um, different units have um, basic EPIC and then different units have to focus on specific area, for example, labor and delivery. So our documentation was um, like you write on the paper, like every 15 minutes you document about the patient's progress, labor, baby's heart rate and stuff every 15 minutes. So now when we have to the electronic part, we had um, documentation that it's already, the, um, the columns are already set. So you go in and just log in. So the documentation was, uh, was able to help us a little bit to document a little bit um, faster and easier and give us more time to take care of the patient versus me rewriting by hand every single time I'm taking care of the patient because I have to write it on the paper. Uh, so documentation was helping. And then so for the informatic side of it is like once we document, if there's anything that any challenges happen or outcome that we did not want, so then they will go back to the documentation and say, okay, did you document every 15 minutes that you are required to do for this high risk mom during laboring, during pushing, did you document every five minutes? So because you are pushing and you don't have time to start writing on the paper again, you're gonna do it afterwards. So if somebody comes a day later, a month later, two years later to check and see, how did you document this patient? Did you follow the standards? And then if you didn't, they're gonna compare your guidelines or your policy with the your care you provided. So the documentation is gonna save you or sink you because if you did not document, that means you did not provide that care, like what Dr. Rando just said. So if you document and you, you have it there, they will compare. If you match everything else, 
that you're supposed to do at that time. And uh, unfortunately, the outcome is not what we wanted. Mm -hmm. Still, you'll be protected with your documentation. So documentation is very important. And that's why the part of the informatics came when we started doing electronic um, documentation, because it keeps us aware of what we are missing, which area we need to improve and be able to provide our nursing care. So mm -hmm. I'll be able to spend more time with my patient versus just being writing on the paper everywhere I go, or maybe you forgot or to do something like that. So it's always um, helpful. So having a specialty in that area, specific in that unit, give you an opportunity to know even more of that area. So that helps. Like what uh, Professor Kaiga just said, um, she was a case manager still with a nursing background because you need to know, see the nursing part, and then you add that responsibility. You can be a nurse anesthetist like Dr. Randall, exactly. You're still a nurse, but you add an um, anesthetic behind it. So you're still working in there. And so that's why nursing has so much uh, we can do if people know what to uh, search. And not everybody's gonna be, um, for example, anesthetist. Not everybody's gonna be informatic. Not everybody's gonna be obstetrician. So you choose whatever the nursing area you want by seeing examples in front of you. And then say, okay, that's what type of nursing um, I want to be. And the more they are aware, then at least we can recruit more people in our nursing profession. So that's good. Yeah, we're getting close to the end. Um, so if, um, or any of the audience who wants to ask a question to the panelists. We can invite the, some of the participants who have not spoken here. I see there is Emmanuel Mwanga. Okay, Emmanuel Mwanga. Do you want to say something? If, if you want to say something. Hello. Hey. Okay, actually I've been impressed even I joined very late, but I've been hearing a lot of discussion going on. So today I have nothing, but I have obtained much from the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming, Emmanuel. Are you a nurse? Yes, I'm a nurse. Which area? Uh, general mid nursing mid midwife. Nursing Hi. Midwife. Very good. Thank yes. you for coming. Yeah, thank you. So next time, well, today we're going to give you a pass. Next time when you come back, we're going to make you speak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I will Margaret. Speak. <laughs> okay, Margaret. <laughs> I have nothing. Thank you very much. Now, today I joined very late. I've forgotten the time, but I enjoyed. Okay, thank you I, for coming. Are you a nurse also? Yeah, I'm a midwife specialist. Nice. See, we have a lot of midwives here. We need to have babies. So then probably you heard about Mr. Wilson's um, improved um, sleep up machine, right? Yeah, I heard about him. Okay, good. Good. So okay. then we have a... Huh? Thank you very much. Thank oh, you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you for coming. Yes. Um, oh. um, so we can go around you for the um, the last um, message from our panelists. And as I said, I take this opportunity to thank everybody uh, for coming and sharing all these um, experiences. We're going to record it and then um, post it uh, on our website and the YouTube and then share as much as we can in WhatsApp groups and stuff. So we can encourage all those young nurses, young um, people who wants to come and join our profession. So as we present today, um, I hope that we inspire a lot of people who wants to come and join us in our nursing profession, because there's a reason we chose in our nursing. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. So I'm gonna give a um, chance from the beginning to the end, anybody just say a few words, what do you want people to get from um, your experience here and as a nurse uh, profession? Let's start with Mr. Wilson. You are next on my screen. <laughs> okay, go ahead if you have anything to say. Yes, anything to say. First, I would like to thank you for making involvement in this discussion. Actually, it's very, very proud to be involved in this discussion. And of course, it's a demire. And if possible, uh, if there is another discussion also, you may involve us. Because it is a demire for ourselves, but also for young generation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And that's the promise. When next time I, I tell you to come, you better show up. 
<laughs> okay, uh, Miss Elizabeth, you're next to my screen. <laughs> Elizabeth Adigramsky. Uh, I also want to say thank you for inviting me as well. Um, that nursing is a profession, you know, for anyone who wants to invest in um, other people, you know, taking care of other people as well as taking care of ourselves. That we have to remember that we have to take care of ourselves in order to take care of others as well. And that, um, that we should further our knowledge and be willing to be mentors to others, but also be willing to learn from others as well, that, you know, to remi remind ourselves that we had mentors, at one, you know, people that we followed and admired that taught us and not to forget that and that to not to forget that we were once students, you know, and that, that we should continue to learn and continue to grow and that, um, that we should always open our hearts and our minds and be always willing to learn and never to forget that. And that we should always pass that on to other people who will want to learn and want to grow as well. And then thank you, Harriet, for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. And I appreciate you spending time with us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'd love to come back again. Yes, you better come back. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, I have uh, Professor Kaiga, please. Any wisdom, nursing, anything? Um, first of all, I would love to say, um, Dr. Randall, I love your background. Where where could we all be? <laughs> you have South a, Florida. Is that your South Florida background? Okay. I'm, fr I'm from Royal Palm Beach. So oh, that's... Well, there we go, but that's... Okay, so <laughs> I didn't do it. here, but the background okay. is just gorgeous because, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> that's that. over, it's over on Palm Beach Island is where I took this picture. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Uh, just saying. Um, <laughs> thank you all very much for having me. Um, lots of words of wisdom from everyone and how do we inspire young nurses and continue to inspire, you know, older nurses too, everybody to, you know, be the best they can um, and do the best we can for all of our patients. Thank you. And Harriet, I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> okay. I'll see you on Monday. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Dr. Rando. <laughs> Okay, well, I think this was a great conference and opportunity to network with people far and near. Um, and it was a great opportunity. I also want to say that nursing is a dynamic process. It is not stagnant. And so therefore, you need to investigate opportunities, take advantage of opportunities, and go, grow, and glow like the sun. That's what I have to say. Nice. I love that. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the Ladies? Is she here? She had to leave. Oh, okay. Um, Ms. Kisa Mokalinga? Hello? Oh, can you oh yes. Me? I can hear you. Yeah. So for me, I'm just saying like a nursing is caring for, for the patients or cash caring for others. And then how do you want us to be treated? So when you take care of the patient, just to think about like, I'm caring for this patient, but today or tomorrow, I may be the one who I need help and how I wanna be treated. And I'm, wish, I'm, wishing, uh, I'm, wish, I'm wishing all the young nurses or even the older nurses all the best. And because nursing is a journey and there's no end of learning. We learn from each other and are uh, wishing all the best. Thank you, Ms. Kisa. Um, on my screen, Mr. Prank, I know you're not a nurse, but you can still give us our, an advice from the observation standpoint. Well, my advice to, to in terms of nursing, um, I don't have any really, but I want to recognize Miss Catherine Gitige for doing an excellent job, and uh, Miss Pendo. I don't know what her full name is, but um, just to recognize them for doing a, a great job there. Yes, they did an excellent job as a moderator. Yeah, thank you for the time um, to ask all the questions to the panelists. 
And, and I want a background like Miss Randall, but I want I want it from Zanzibar. <laughs> well, you have to go to Tanzania and then go to Zanzibar and take that picture. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see. Anybody else I have in on the list? Okay, um, so just to finish up, I just want to thank everybody who has been here today and um, thank you for coming and thank you for sharing all these um, opportunities so we're able to um, inspire new nurses, um, as what Ms. Kaiga say, um, even seasoned nurses, they might need some inspiration because maybe they've been working so hard and um, it, it gets sometimes uh, you get burned out, especially like this pandemic time. The nurse has been stretched thin, so everybody is um, working like overload. And um, sometimes the people start questioning, "Why did I come and uh, become a nurse?" So if we see each other, we need to support each other and you know um, inspire each other, so we can continue doing what we love to do about taking care of our patients. But also, we should not forget ourselves. So we need to take care of ourselves, so we can be strong enough to take care of others. So I just want to say thank you very much for spending this second day with us. Um, Team QHSC saying thank you and welcome back. And once you come, um, you come once, you have to come every time we have conferences. So we can come and hear you. <laughs> Your advice and opinion and stuff. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. As I said, we're going to make... Um, put these videos together and then I'll send it um, to everybody who attended and people who are registered. I know some of people have um, issues with the internet, but um, as I said, we had almost like 78 people who registered and I know um, sometimes either people forget or internet is an issue, but usually they um, register so they can get the audio, So, which is fine. Either way, we want our message to get there to every single person who is interested so we can share and inspire others. So again, you guys for being here, you inspire me. So I keep going. And so thank you very much. And God bless you. If everybody can wave and say bye. So we cover that. <laughs> Maybe those who are not in the video will come to the video and we'll see them. Oh, Emmanuel, Kisa, Margaret, and Janet. Can you guys have a video for like two seconds? Maybe somebody. Whatever reason my video is, is not working today, so I'm there with you. I love you all. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay, Danny. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, oh, there is Margaret. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, and be well. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Zanzibar. Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> So, Margaret, you're in Zanzibar. We need to find you. <laughs> For real, you're in Zanzibar? Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, okay. I'm in Zanzibar. Oh, can you stay back? I need to talk to you. <laughs> okay. Yes, we are planning to come to Zanzibar. So, we need to, uh, we're going to be doing the medical mission. So, um, oh. yes, so that's part of it. We're going to come to Zanzibar for at least a day or so. Um, okay, the whole yes. team for QHS next month. So we need to. Um, do you know my email? You have my email, right? Yeah, I think I I I I saw in you in my email also. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. So then, yeah, we get in touch, and then, um, yeah, we're, we're gonna come with uh, almost whew, nineteen people. So <laughs> oh, you are yeah, so it's gonna be a big group. Okay, welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Okay, okay guys. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye. Oh, bye. Catherine has bye. a team, the whole team. <laughs> Those are young nurses. Yes, we need to recruit the young nurses. <laughs> I have new generation here. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, guys. Bye. Take care. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Q H S C.